Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Savage, and I'm the president of the City School District of Albany Board of Education. On behalf of the board, I welcome you to our virtual meeting. I am joined tonight in person by the entire board, Hassan Almanyawi, Damaris Mann, Sridhar Chitter, Ellen Krejci, Tabitha Wilson, and Vicki Smith are all with, with me here today. Um, we have a couple people here from the public, and if you are in per here in person and plan to speak in public, please comment tonight. Please make sure you have signed in with Ms. Bowie at the end of the table. This meeting is being live streamed, and the instructions to view our meetings are available tonight at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE. We will show the relevant slides and documents in the virtual meeting screen, as well as, of course, here in the screens in this room. You can also access them via albanyschools.org forward slash BOE if you need to be able to control the slides yourself. Those of you joining us in person tonight know that we are taking precautions consistent with those required for schools by both the New York State Department of Health and the CDC. We do always use this large room for our meetings, which has generally allowed us to have as many people attend as want. We do have an overflow room and we can use that if necessary. With that introduction, we invite those of you who choose to join us as we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. In addition to saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we always focus our meeting by restating the mission of the City School District of Albany, which is to work in partnership with our diverse community to engage every learner in a robust educational program designed to provide the knowledge and skills necessary for success. Before we move on to the superintendent's report, I did want to mention that starting at our next meeting, we do anticipate being able to be open for virtual public comment. So you should all be, uh, anyone who wants to speak in public comment but not physically come to this space, should take a look at the addressing the board page at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE. The instructions will be going up there sometime in the next couple of days as to how you register for uh, virtual public comment. So we're very excited to have that finally up and running. It's been something the board has been looking forward to for some time. We really believe in public comment and want people to feel free to share their thoughts with us without the inconvenience of having to physically come to this space. And with that exciting news, I will now ask the superintendent if she has a report for us. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, Madam President, members of the board. As we celebrate Black History Month throughout February, we are confronted not with only the rich, complex, and often stark historic perspective of the African-American experience in the United States, but also the poignancy of this year's theme, which is Black health and wellness. This theme is well-timed as the COVID-19 public health crisis continues to challenge all of us, both in America and around the world. However, as with many persistent social issues in our country, such as poverty, unemployment, underemployment, the pandemic has hit hardest communities of color. In our community, we are fortunate to have a wide range of partners whose efforts and expertise su support our health and well being. Whitney M. Young Jr. Health Center is one of those partners. Named for the quietly powerful civil rights leader of the 1950s and 60s, Whitney Young Health provides access to the consistent health, quality health care without regard to income. This includes the school-based health centers at Albany High School, Giffen Memorial Elementary School, Philip J. Schuyler Achievement Academy, and Sheridan Preparatory Academy. Our partnership with Whitney Young also includes the Mobile Health Unit, um, Whitney on Wheels, and the Seal a Smile Dental Program in collaboration with the Health Capital District Initiative. During Black History Month and all year long, we are glad to celebrate the significant contributions of both Whitney Young the man and the healthcare organization in our community that bears his name and carries forward his legacy of empowerment, opportunity, and opportunity for the African-American community. This week is also National School Counselors Week, a time where we recognize and celebrate the tremendous work of our school counselors that they do for our students and families each day. School counselors are best known for providing academic guidance to students, but they do so much more. They are a vital part of the social and emotional support team at our schools. They promote access and equity. 
They advise, inform, direct, and comfort hundreds of students, helping them plan and set goals for life after graduation. School counselors are cheerleaders and advocates, connecting students with supports and services that they need to succeed at all grade levels. Please take time to thank and appreciate a school counselor for all they do to positively impact the lives of the young people they serve. I would also like to congratulate Albany High School science teacher Kristen Bonds for her selection as a New York State master teacher. She is one of 230 new master teachers from around the state that Governor Kathy Hochul announced last week. The prestigious four-year master teacher program recognizes high-performing teachers of STEM subjects. Master teachers are selected for their ongoing work in STEM education and their commitment to deepen their knowledge about the area of study, their students, and their teaching strategies. As a master teacher, Bonds will engage in peer mentoring and intensive content-oriented professional development throughout the year, work closely with new teachers to foster a supportive environment for the next generation of STEM teachers, attend regional meetings at the University at Albany and participate in and lead several professional development sessions and receive a $15,000 annual stipend. Bond selection now gives the district six teachers currently participating in the Master Teachers Program. She joins Brent Katie, Jeffrey Chu, Ashley Finke, El I'm sorry, Eileen Rigon, and Shannon Stevenson. Albany High Math teacher Erin Erickson also is a master teacher who completed the program previously. I would also like to congratulate William S. Hackett Middle School social worker Ava Holt and Albany High family consumer science teacher Kimberly DeHart for their recognition this month in Channel 13's top teacher program. They are among 13 educators selected this year out of more than 400 nominations from the capital region. This is an outstanding recognition for excellent work for these two educators for the work that they do to support our students' academic and social and emotional growth. Congratulations are also in order as well for Albany High senior Elon Klingerman for his victory last weekend in the 110 pound weight class at the section two class A wrestling tournament. Klingerman is Albany High's first class A wrestling champion since Sean Berman, who won the 96 pound weight class in 2011. Klingerman will be back on the mat this weekend at the section two tournament competing for a chance to represent the section and Albany High at the state tournament. Good luck this weekend and good luck to all of our student athletes who are competing in sectionals this month. This is a very busy time of year. Five pieces of art created by Albany High students are on display this month at the 2022 Art in Three Dimensions show. The student artists are sophomore, Lalela, I'm sorry, Layla Nunn, Dow, Dowdell, and I'm not saying that right. Uh, senior Lydia Green, sophomore Catherine Myers, and senior Sydney Spienberg, who has two pieces selected. Our students were supported by Albany High art teachers, Thea Relesa and Ashley Johns. The pieces on display are among 79 selected from 221 submitted for the juried ex exhibition organized each year by the Capital Area Art Supervisors. The show runs through the end of the month at Mohanesen High School in Rotterdam. A reminder that all of our schools will be closed for President's Day and winter recess during the week of February 21st. All of our schools and offices will be closed Monday, February 21st. Our district offices at Academy Park will be open for the rest of the week and offices at Harriet Gibbons Student Service Center will be closed the full week. I hope everyone has a safe and relaxing break. 
It is now my pleasure to introduce Principal Kendra Chairs Francis to share information about the great things happening this year at Philip J. Schuyler Achievement Academy. Providing us the opportunity to speak to you today about a place that's very near and dear to our heart, uh, Philip J. Schuyler Achievement Academy. I want to share with you our school vision and mission and our core values. Philip J. Schuyler Achievement Academy equips all our scholars with the academic and social emotional knowledge and awareness needed to make good choices, advocate for themselves and their community and to transform the world. We, we seek to accomplish this vision um, through our mission, which is as a community school uh, to create a positive and culturally responsive child centered learning environment that sets high expectations for achievement and success. All of our staff, families and community partners will work together to provide opportunities that empower students to be agents of change. Our core values is that we are that we believe in equity for all. We have high expectations for everyone. We strive for ex excellence and we believe in the innate ability of everyone to achieve their goals. As for our demographics, uh, Skylar Achievement Academy uh, has 277 students enrolled in grades free kindergarten through grade five, which is a slight decrease, very small decrease from last year. We are considered too deep in that we have two sections at each grade level. There are 14 general education classrooms and two self-contained special education classrooms. One serves students in kindergarten and the other students in grades four and five. Our demographics have not shifted much since I visited you last year. Uh, about 47 of our percent of our population are African American, 12% percent are Asian, 10% are multiracial, 6% are white, and 25% are Hispanic. Some additional demographic information that I wanted to share is that 20% of our students are considered L's, 10% um, are students with disabilities, and 84% of our students are considered economically disadvantaged. Our set focus um, is pretty similar to what we've had in the past. We um, have gone a little bit deeper this year and that um, our focus. Number one is on planning and delivering equitable instruction in ELA for all students. And we accomplish this by providing a focus on supporting our teachers with planning and delivering instruction that is aligned to the standards. And new this year, we've gone deeper with a focus on our uh, tier one supports, which is that we are working to provide support for all students in phonics based on their level. So in addition to focusing on comprehension, we're also focusing on building those phonics skills for our students so that they can access the text on their own. In terms of mathematics, we're focusing on delivering a deeper understanding of the next generation standards and mathematical practices um, and also using the Bridges uh, intervention curriculum. That's new this year. Our teachers have received some professional development in that and we've used that alongside our math interventionists to provide supports for students who have experienced unfinished learning um, due to our recent uh, COVID closure due to COVID. And the last area of focus is reducing chronic absenteeism. And that also leads us to what Ms. Jones Oliver is going to share with us today, one of our challenges. Thank you, Ms. Jones Oliver, Assistant Principal at SCA. Uh, one of the challenges, as uh, the principal said, is chronic absenteeism. And so what we've done is use a, a, a variety of things on the communication outreach. We reach out to parents by phone or home visit when students are not in school. And we praise parents when they come to school. Ms. Venable, our homeschool coordinator, Mr. Everett, our community schools coordinator, conduct home visits quite frequently when needed. So I use robocalls to encourage attendance in school daily for one week prior to and one week following a day off or vacation. We have the following interventions that we've used. We've generated a list of chronically absent students based on data on Power BI and school tool, monthly meetings with our attendance officer, and we create attendance plans for those students. The team, attendance team also reviewed the data of chronically absent students to monitor the impact of the interventions and make necessary adjustments to support increased attendance for our chronically absent students. Some of the incentives, incentives for students and parents are, we have mail certificates home for students who have a good attendance, shout outs during our morning meetings, and we praise parents for ensuring their students are in school. And some of the things that we do in leveraging resources to address barriers, we recognize COVID is a barrier, tutors and transportation as well. 
and some of our successes. SAI has a newly formed student leadership team that we're so proud of. Inquiry and Innovation Lab, we are extremely proud of. And we are now in the throes of a school renaming. We have formed a committee to include Kendra Chairs Francis, our principal, Marilyn Jones Oliver, and me, the assistant principal, and the following, Barbara Smith, Brandon Everett, Michael Poindexter, Tanya Venable, Laura Abate, Daniel Camarada, Barry Walston, Tammy Coleman, and we even have a fifth grade class pres uh, representative, Anthony O'Parker, Mary Liz Stewart, and Tracy Spooner, and of course, Michelle Bridgewater. You can visit our school renaming link at albanyschools.org slash rename. We're asking for suggestions on February 14th, and we have some flyers. Thank you. All right, so we would like to close our presentation by having our student leadership team share with you some things that are special about Skylar and also what it, why they decided to take the leap and become leaders in our building. It's called the ready room. The reason why I like the ready room is because it can help you feel a lot up or high and to calm all those emotions down. Like for example, if you get sad, you can come to the ready room and get help from Miss, uh, from the four teachers that are in here. And it's also called the support office if you don't like your name, ready room. So, and this is what I like about the ready room. Peace. The reason I joined the student leadership team was so that I could be a part of things that will help our school. Something that's coming up that can be very helpful to our school is the renaming. We need a name that better fits the mission of our school. Something I love about the, love something I love about the school is that it provides different places that can help kids be successful. It has a ready room, it has a band, it has an orchestra, it has an art room, so many things that can help kids find what they actually want to do. Hi, I'm Anave and I'm the president of the Student Leadership Team and Scholar Achievement Academy. I ran in the election because I felt that it was going to be exciting, it was going to be cool, and it was actually a really great event, and I enjoyed it a lot. And now, since I am president, I feel that I'm able to help students younger than me to help them succeed in school even more, like when students are having a bad day, now I feel like I can help them even more by giving them like a little pep talk than I could do before. Um, I like, so what I like is about Skylar Achievement Academy is um, that we, we have teachers to help us and we also have, we also have people supporting us. And the reason why I joined the um, Skylar Achievement Government Leadership Team is because I because I wanted to help people and people that needed help. Hi, my name is Azir, and I like the school because it makes us protected and safe. The reason I became a student leadership because so I could be a leader and be an example for younger students. Hi, my name is Mahogany and I'm, a, and I'm a member of the student leadership team. And I joined because 
they were um, going to change the name of the school, and the school is named after a person that did bad things, and he was a slave owner, and he owned about 15 or 14 slaves. And I also joined because I wanted to be a role model for the kids and the students, and I wanted to show them that they have a voice and they can do anything. Thank you, Ms. Sheriff Francis and Ms. Jones Oliver. We appreciate you being here and um, sharing all of the great things that are happening at your school. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Well, while we don't normally do questions or anything after these reports, we do want to really appreciate you for taking advantage of the school renaming policy that was developed by Michael Poindexter. We are so excited to see you guys take ownership of finding the right name for your school. And, um, and it sounds like you have a wonderful committee developed and we're really looking forward to, to watching you go through that new process. So thank you so much for taking advantage of that. Thank you. At this time, we'll move through with our district update. And our district update, of course, we start with our vision, mission, and goals to make sure that everything that we're doing is in alignment with our vision, mission, and goals. Tonight, our topics are really about COVID-19. So we have three subcategories, cases, testing, and vaccines. Much of this information you've seen before, the numbers are just changing. Uh, when we started, uh, we're looking to date. Uh, as of 2-8-22, we have total confirmed cases, 1,317. Uh, 959 are students, 235 faculty, 123 staff members. Through February, we think it's important to note that we were at an, uh, about eight cases was our daily average. This is the second highest monthly average since our pandemic began. In January, we had 877 total cases, which put us at about a 28.3 daily average. Uh, back in December, we were at 6.2, November 4.7 daily average, October 5.1 daily average, and September was the lowest at 2.9. Uh, we continue to encourage our families to make sure that they're prepared with backup plans. Uh, as you see the notices that come out each day, you're seeing the numbers start to taper down, which we are very happy about that direction. We do want to caution our families because we do have win we have winter break coming up. And we want to make sure that we are still following the protocols for COVID so that we can keep those numbers down. For testing, we have um, employees reported status thus far. We're at 69.6% of those who have provided proof of vaccination. We are down to 30% of those who, are, who have not submitted proof of vaccination. We continue with our weekly testing of those employees. Uh, we have time slots available, but they do have to register first. Uh, one thing to note is that even though employees may be vaccinated, if they are choosing to get tested on a regular basis, they are able to do so. So we're not just testing those who do not have proof of vaccination, we're testing employees who also have proof of vaccination so that should they so choose. Also with testing, um, we have distributed nearly 31,000 test kits since December 31st. And so we are very happy about that. Our weekly shipments continue to come in from the State Department and we push those out to our schools. We know that with winter break coming up, we would like to make sure that each student has a test kit to go home with and we will be sending out guidance because we would like for them to test before they come back just to make sure that everyone is safe. Uh, we have the five day quarantine protocols that are listed there. We have had that presented several times, so I won't read through that. But we have our five day quarantine protocols and also our test to stay uh, and reporting requirements that are listed. The other piece uh, with regard to testing, we still have in person testing for employees and students each weekday at Albany High School and at Harriet Gibbons. Uh, the times are listed there. Pre-registration is required. Just follow the link and register. We also want to remind people that you're not to eat or drink anything 30 minutes before testing. No gum, mints, cough, lozenges, et cetera, um, the 30 minutes before taking the test. Vaccine, vaccine information. We urge everyone five and older who's able and eligible to get a vaccine. 
Our next uh, vaccination clinic is on Thursday, February 17th at Philip Schuyler from 4.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, also, the County Health Department has immunization clinics. The Crossgates Mall has 10 vaccination sites, uh, is one of 10 vaccination sites statewide for children 5 to 11. So you could go to Crossgates Mall as well. And then if you need to find any other locations, please go to vaccines.gov or you can call the number on the screen. At this time, are there any questions with regard to our district update? Board Member Tracy. I just had a quick question about the COVID testing at the high school and it's if students have pre-registered with the website, can they just walk in if they want to test or do you need to have a parent with you or parent permission first? They do have to go in and um, typically if we need the parent based on, you know, where they are with the nurses, if they need the parent, they can do it verbally over the phone. Parent does not have to be present. Thank you. Board Member Smith. Thank you. And maybe I should, uh, this, this has to do with the future. Should I wait on that question? Let's see if there's other questions about what's already happened. Thank you for making that distinction. Anybody else with a question about what we have right now? I had one quick question, which I have lost the thread of, which is, um, are we providing test kits now? I know we did proactive test kit provision to anyone who wanted them for quite some time, but the test kits that we have in hand now, we're using primarily for students who have been exposed or tested positive. Is that right? That is correct, but believe me, we, we have plenty of test kits, so we will be prepared for next week to send students home with test kits. That sounds fantastic. Thank you very much. Board Member Smith. Thank you. And Superintendent, I know you and other superintendents and the governor, they, they, there was a meeting. Um, just a question, and I know there are lots of things we don't know answers to, but um, after, say, the break, uh, Will, do you imagine that this will be optional mask? Do you have any insight into what the governor's plans might be? And also testing, how do we, does that continue? So at our meeting, the superintendent's meeting with Governor Hochul, um, we were informed that we are staying the course right now until um, we get through, I think she, be, I believe that she said until March. So it will be after break. We do have, you know, the appeal that the decisions need to be made through the courts and she is watching the numbers. She's looking at what the infection rates are and all of those things. She's using the data and the science to make that decision. And what she informed us was that um, she would be looking roughly around March in order to make that decision. As you know, we have followed the guidance of our healthcare professionals since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we are not looking to veer away from that. And so we await that guidance and then we will adjust accordingly um, based on the guidance. And I'm just going to chime in that that meeting also included the New York State School Boards Association, the Big Five, the Principals Association, the PTA, a number of other speakers. It was it one just, meeting and the governor was quite clear, no change in masks in schools until break. After that, as the superintendent said, she's going to watch multiple factors. Um, people really wanted to get her to say, when this number turns up, then you can take your mask off. And she was very clear that she was not going to do that, that she wanted to have the um, ability to look at the picture holistically. Um, so that was good. Um, but we have also had some communication from our legislative leaders sort of asking for our uh, thoughts on it. And we have stressed the, I think every organization we participate with has stressed the need for certainty and clarity mm -hmm. and the desire to have public health professionals make public health decisions. Um, and so I hope that that is being heard at the highest levels um, and that we will not be in a position where individual districts will be being asked to make public health decisions for which we really do not have the right um, set of staff to make those decisions. So we are advocating for that every single day. Um, okay, anything else on COVID-19 district update? If not, thank you very much. And I think that brings us then to the part of our meeting we call public comment. Um, we do have two written comments tonight, um, but no in-person or voicemail comments. We do welcome input from the community about the decisions we are making. We have a long-standing policy in which we set aside up to 30 minutes of each meeting to hear from district residents, parents, students, and other members of our community. If there are more comments than can be accommodated in 30 minutes, our policy gives us the opportunity to extend the length of the public comment period or to establish a second public comment period later in the meeting or at a different time. 
We do accept comments in writing and by voicemail. All of that is on albanyschools.org forward slash BOE. Be addressing the board pages where you want to go to figure out how that all works. And there's a form there that allows you to submit a, co a comment in writing, which is how the two comments that we have in front of us came in today. We do ask all commenters to keep in mind that information about individual students and specific district staff can't be shared. Not only is that a violation of their privacy, but every student and every district staff member deserves the due process they are entitled to and to know the concerns about them will not be aired in public. For that reason, if somebody submits a written comment, the board member who reads their comment passes over or substitutes alternative words if individual names are mentioned. And we also do try to eliminate those names whenever they pop up in a voicemail. We also encourage all of our community members to realize that the board is not the place to start when you have a concern about something in the district. We ask that you start first with the relevant staff member, such as the teacher or principal. If you find a concern is not addressed adequately, you can appeal that up to the person's supervisor, up the chain of command, if necessary, to the superintendent, although usually it can get solved before that. Decisions made by the superintendent may be appealed to the board. We received two written comments, um, which will be read aloud now by board member El Minyawi. If the author is listening and notes that we have pronounced their name improperly, we very much apologize and would appreciate your taking a moment to contact us to let us know how we should have pronounced it. Board member El Minyawi. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> I am gonna take my mask off because it's just gonna be easier. Okay, so the first letter uh, comes from Nell Brady. It states, I am writing to express my concerns about the speed at which the feeder realignment plan is being implemented and the fact that most of the scenarios presented at the Albany Feeder Realignment Committee meeting Tuesday night have New Scotland Elementary uh, students attending North Albany Middle School. My husband and I were aware that the feeder realignment discussions were happening, but it wasn't until last night, uh, last week that we learned that the plan would be implemented next school year. We think this change is far too abrupt. The students in this district need more time to adjust and to get familiar with their new school before next year. It was also alarming to learn that the feeder realignment plan might mean that New Scotland students would attend North Albany Middle School. North Albany is too far for New Scotland elementary families. To require first year middle school students to ride the dis this distance, transfer, and walk is neither practical nor beneficial for their adjustment. It might not be the furthest distance within all the scenarios, but it is probably the longest drive. There is no easy route. This would no doubt limit involvement in school activities and feelings of connection to the school. There must be a scenario that will work better for all families. We appreciate that the, we appreciate that this is a very difficult decision and that the committee has clearly done a tremendous amount of work so far. There are many interests and factors to weigh. I am grateful to the committee members who are invested in the success of our students. However, the decisions made on Tuesday to narrow down the scenarios to eight were being made too quickly and based on the opinions of a small group of people. Given this is such an impactful decision, this phase of the project should take more time and careful consideration. We ask the board to consider the following. Delaying implementation of the feeder realignment plan to allow families to prepare and for the district to ensure they've selected the best scenario and to plan accordingly. Looking very closely at New Scotland Elementary School to North Albany uh, scenarios to understand why those options were put forward and how they could best serve the district. Listening to the New Scotland Elementary School families, as well as families in other parts of the district, and incorporate that feedback into the decision making process. Thank you for all that you do for Albany students. Uh, my next letter comes from Kimberly Fortune. And I'm going to do my best with this. Um, has no periods. Um, you guys are not doing enough regarding Albany City School District. You guys as the board are failing miserably. 
You're not caring. It's you're not adequately wanting to teach these children. The people you're hiring are a joke. Albany City School District children are suffering. The most you guys closed the school for um, two weeks, but other schools in the city were open. What sense did that make? You're hiring people that don't give a damn. You got teachers left and right that's not coming to work because I don't know what. You guys are dropping the ball and you're a mockery. Yeah, are hurting these babies in the education and you're not caring at all. It's disgusting. I mean, something has to be done. You're not adequately cleaning these schools and taking virtu uh, virtual and putting it in the forefront when these children need better than virtual education. It's bad enough the, ch the child don't want to teach the black and brown babies in the inner city schools, which we all know what the word in the city means, the hood, ghetto, and you're not caring at all. I don't treat children like this in Loudonville Colony. I know this is not considered Albany County, but so what? Yeah, doing the capital district children dirty and y'all don't care. And the reason why is because the Albany City School District children are filled with nothing but black and brown babies and y'all never wanted to educate them. And that's the last of the letters we have. Even when they're here to hear, we do appreciate hearing from our public and we appreciate all the public comments. In general, we find comments valuable, especially when they have specific suggestions or thoughts about decisions we're making. Our contact information for both public comment and for routine correspondence is at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE. We now move on to the part of our meeting we call routine consent. During this portion of the meeting, we approve routine matters for the district, including items like contracts, field trips, personnel matters, and the like. Each board member reviews each item carefully, but we vote on them as a group with no discussion. This allows us to use our meeting time more efficiently. Nonetheless, each board member has the option to set aside any routine consent item in order to require a separate discussion and a separate vote on that item. With that introduction, I'll now entertain a motion to adopt the routine consent agenda. Motion by board member Smith, second. Second by board member El Minyawi. Are there any set asides? Board member Mann. Items 31, 32, and 33. Can you just give me the names so we make sure that we're in alignment on the, what we're just setting aside? Northern Reservoirs into the two Parsons. Okay. Anything else that needs to be set aside? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the routine of consent agenda, less those three items. That is unanimous. Board member Mann, can we take those three together? Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion for adopting those three contracts. Motion by board member Chator, second by board member Krejci. Uh, any discussion? Board member Mann? Let go. All right. I'm just going to abstain because I work for the uh, organization. Thank you very much. All in favor of adopting those three contracts? That is unanimous, less board member Mann who abstains. Thank you very much. That is the end of routine consent. Um, there, was a, there was a little bit of feedback there, but I think that, that went away good. Um, now we're going to move on to a very brief policy agenda. Uh, Dr. Chitor. Thank you, Madam President and the board. As a member, last time we had a discussion or we introduced uh, policy 4772, which is graduation ceremonies. Are there any questions on that? If not, we have a motion to adopt. Motion by Board Member Smith, second by uh, Board Member Wilson. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. I'm just double checking my agenda. Um, that is the end of the action agenda. We always try and structure our meetings with actions first. Um, that way we get folks who want to only listen to the actions can do that. We can still take an action. We are not prohibited from taking an action after this fact, and we sometimes have done that, but in general, we do not plan, nor does our agenda include an action item for tonight beyond the ones that we've already taken. Instead, we're going to move on to the discussion portion of our agenda, which begins with the feeder alignment committee about which we already received some public comment. 
board, um, board member, <laughs> Superintendent Adams. Thank you so very much, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, this presentation will be a joint presentation. And so we're going to, I will start and then um, we will have uh, Madam President present a portion of this meeting and then I will conclude. Uh, I wanted to first acknowledge um, our vision, mission and goal statement. As always, it has been our guiding, uh, our guiding principles as we have done this work with the Feeder Alignment Committee. Uh, our agenda tonight, we'll look at the committee overview. We'll review some of the items just to make sure that we bring everything back full circle. The enrollment pattern considerations, enrollment model metrics, the additional considerations that came about. We'll look at where we started. We'll look at where, we're, where we are now. Uh, scenario analysis, community engagement, and our community survey and next steps. The purpose of the committee was to engage committee members and district personnel in a partnership to develop criteria to make recommendations for an equitable feeder pattern for all students transitioning from elementary school to middle school. And this work began last summer um, with one representative from each school. Five members carried the work forward through the fall. We did develop an ad hoc committee of three board members that have joined us in December along with University at Albany statistician, Dr. Ken Robin. Um, the parents are listed there, Dorian Salat, uh, William Lemon, Daniel Katz, Talia Harrell, and Marina Marco O'Malley. We are very pleased with the work that they have done and I do have to give accolades to this committee because part of doing the work of a committee is actually doing the work so that you understand what it is that the district goes through as well as how decisions are made and then being able to still represent the community that you are coming forward with some of the concerns but also understanding the bigger picture of what the goals are for the entire district and and where what we look to do in order to accomplish that equity among our three middle schools our board members president savage dr chatur and um, Secretary Dr. Shatur and member Hassan Amanyawe, I thank you so very much for your support in this work and working with our committee. Uh, President Savage, thank you. You have brought your expertise of Excel spreadsheets to a whole new level. And we want to say thank you. Um, taking the work that was done from our committee uh, with all the work that they were able to do and then take it to the next level and then we would be remiss if we did not thank Dr. Robin for his uh, special unique talents of uh, being a statistician to help us look at a quantitative way with, to develop scenarios and look at what's in the best interest of our students. And then let us have that discussion of those very qualitative measures that still impact that decision. And so what we are sharing tonight is really a balance of both the qualitative and the quantitative measures that we have gone and that we have analyzed, synthesized, and now we're ready to share that information out so that the board can have that discussion uh, about what it is that we want for our middle school students. And so at the very beginning, the goal was that we would have three middle schools roughly the same size. We know that there may be some variation, but roughly the same size. All three middle schools would have students who have similar resources. So that way we can disperse resources in an equitable manner to meet the needs of the students. Uh, continue to feed elementary schools to middle schools to allow students uh, with relationships to continue. Uh, what types of preferences might we be looking at to ensure that continuity? and also support our families. So we created a model that predicted enrollment and student resources that, that need, needs at every possible level. Uh, we also, uh, from the likely candidates, used our knowledge and understanding to identify the best options. And there were two main components, enrollment and student need. So the timeline would be to implement the new feeder pattern for the 22-23 school year for sixth grade only, meaning our fifth graders would be the ones that were impacted first, adding a new sixth grade cohort each year until the pattern was fully implemented by the 24-25 school year. 
and students currently in grades six through seventh will remain in place until moving on to high school. Enrollment pattern considerations, balancing the total enrollment for each building, and then looking at the resources as I just spoke about and the needs of our students, both academically, looking at attendance, discipline, et cetera, to make sure that we could um, balance out that distribution of resources. One of our metrics with regard to equity is looking at that equitable distribution of our resources. And so that's very important that we look at those other factors that impact a school. The number of school changes from the current feeder pattern. Um, and we started looking at just school changes and that morphed into looking at individual students and how many individual students would be changed. And then transportation factors were considered distance. Um, at first we looked at the distance of the school from the middle school. And then as we started looking at scatter plots where students live, we realized that it was really more important to look at where students live with regard to their distance to and from the middle school. So all of those things were considered. And then additional factors that were considered in projecting enrollment, looking at the current grades three through five, not just the fifth graders, expanding that view to third through fifth grade. A large number of new students entering uh, the district in sixth grade. Um, we average about 84 new students over three years, and so we wanted to make sure that we were able to analyze that data. Returning and new entrants self-contained special education students, looking at the assignment of those programs based on the needs of our students. Uh, six self-contained classrooms at each middle school where possible. That would be something that we would be looking at doing. The continuous enrollment of students from elementary to middle, being able to predict how many students we keep from elementary to middle school um, in, within our district. And so we looked at 81%, 81.8, uh, yes, 81.8% of our non self contained students transition to the district middle schools. And this is the data from 2018, 2019, um, 2018, 19, and the 1920. Um, we used grades five through six grades six through seven based on that transition to school. About 84.8% of our self-contained students stay with us. And so we felt that that was very important to look at. The other component that we looked at was the fact that we have started small with dual language and looking at the fact that that is going to grow over time. And so this is the first year of the dual expansion. And so we'll see it double in size, one grade level at a time as we proceed from year to year. And so we did feel that the feeder pattern would allow or should allow balanced enrollment both now and in the future. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn the time over to President Savage. Uh, to discuss some of the enrollment pattern considerations a little bit deeper with some of those considerations that came about our enrollment model metrics and then looking at some additional considerations that impacted our scenarios. Thank you very much. Um, my role in this has been primarily to be the Excel jockey. I have not uh, put my own knowledge in here. This was all based on the um, information and statistics provided by Dr. Ken Robin and by the influence of the committee who really focused on, uh, helped us focus on the priority elements. So as the superintendent just explained, we've considered a number of factors in trying to project enrollment. The basic concept was to look at every possible scenario and project enrollment for that scenario um, and try and find scenarios that would meet our goal of having three balanced middle schools. There are a lot of tiny words and a lot of tiny numbers on this slide. You do not need to understand or read all of them. They are the exact same information that the superintendent just gave to you from the prior slide, but it just gives you a sense of the complexity. For each school, we predicted how many fifth graders would be returning based on our existing grade three through five. We took an average of those three years and, and using a retention rate we know not all of our students who are in fifth grade reappear in our middle schools, right? Some of them go to charter school, some of them go to private school, some of them move, things happen to people. So we took that retention rate and we factored that in. In addition, we found, and this was one of the pieces of analysis that I think several of us on the committee found surprising, 
when we did that analysis to find out how many kids came back, we discovered, oh, well, yes, that not all of them come back. But in fact, there's a whole bunch of new kids, not just a few, but a whole bunch. On average, 84 new sixth graders each year, right? That's And we only have roughly 600 kids per grade. So we thought, okay, well, how are we going to account for that? We know that our policy is to feed our new entrants to middle school based on their home address, wherever they would have gone to elementary school. So that's how that second row of numbers distributes. And that's why there's zeros in, this, in the certain columns. Those are the uh, magnet programs because we don't feed any new entrants based on a magnet enrollment. Obviously, that's all based on a um, home neighborhood school enrollment. The next line down where it says total enrollment fed by feeder pattern, that's just the sum of those two numbers. That's fairly straightforward. The bottom, the next one underneath it has one blue item. That is our dual doubling, right? Right now, if you take what our grade three through five and apply the retention, you would get 16. Someday, once we finally get there, it will double, but it is going to be quite a few years. And as you all know, um, board colleagues, planning for enrollment in Albany year by year is an adventure, let alone four or five or six years from now. Um, so that is, those are the numbers that we use to define the enrollment of the middle school by neighborhood. In addition, we anticipate self-contained students, as the superintendent said, will be fed into six classrooms per middle school and that the staff will align those middle schools as much as possible to not separate our self-contained students from their general ed neighborhood um, school colleagues because we like to, whenever possible, maintain those relationships, um, but that they would balance those themselves. We also looked historically at how many new entrants we get that are self-contained. That's that small 11 number. So that is based on historically how many new entrants are self-contained. In addition, we know that generally we send about 45 students from the middle school to TCCE um, for the alternative program there to the Tony Clement Center for Education. And so that gives us our 1,605 students in each middle school, uh, I mean, in the Hackett, Myers, and North Albany, 535 on average. If they were all perfectly aligned, there'd be 535 students per middle school. Below that, you're going to see your TCCE number and your AIC number. Those are our predicted numbers for our total predicted enrollment of 1741. That's versus our current enrollment of 1836, all right? And I told you how I got there. We took the grade three through five. We took a retention figure. We added in the newcomers historically, and that's where we ended up. So it's a little bit lower. That doesn't surprise me. We know our enrollment has, um, has been trending down, although with what's happening in Afghanistan and refugees coming in, we may see that trending up again. In Albany, it's always an adventure. The good news is if we're really at 535 students at each school, we have plenty of room to accommodate additional students because we know that sort of the 600, 630 is a, is a kind of the maximum we want if we're gonna have um, two teams at each grade. So that's how the enrollment piece worked. Then the next question is how did we look at the performance, like we don't just care that the right number of students is in each scenario or is in each school in a scenario, but we also want the students to have a comparable level of need because that is something that we have identified as problematic in our current model is that we have a school that has a higher need ratio than we have in other schools. So how are we gonna get to that, that question? And this was where Dr. Robin really brought in his expertise and he recommended we use these four major categories academics, attendance, discipline, and a thing called the risk score, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute. Academics, very familiar information there, NWEA scores and New York State test scores. He was very selective in which ones he used depending on whether he wanted to um, think about the impact of COVID because we know COVID really um, played with some of those numbers. So he was extremely thoughtful about that. He also wanted to look at attendance, um, both in, in two ways. One is overall attendance, and the second one is this um, question of chronically absent, right? Because your overall attendance rate is one thing, but if you have a whole lot of students, you're, you're doing the kind of check-in calls like you're having, um, and Mrs. Jones-Oliver talked about today, that's a huge amount of resources that you're expending on that, so trying to balance that. Discipline. Obviously, every referral, every time a student needs to have a discipline referral, that's a resource, staff resources that are involved. But there's also a question of how many students have referral, right? So the top number is total referral in, uh, events. The second one is how many students. And all of these things, along with the risk score, were factored into a composite score. The risk score is an average risk score developed by the district which I think has been very helpful and I'll let operational staff to speak to this at some point if people wanna ask more about this, um, but to help us identify children who might otherwise slip through the cracks. 
you know, they might be just sort of like a little marginal on a lot of things and they might not raise to the level of, oh, we better pay attention to this guy. By putting them to get, putting all this information in one place, we can start paying attention. Oh, we better pay a lot more attention to this particular child. And they've used that risk score to my understanding in that way. We use the risk score to try and balance the schools. It has never been used that way before. It is not a like, you know, well-researched deep thing that has been used over and over again. So Dr. Uh, Robin encouraged us to be you know, a little cautious about using it in this way. And he only used it as a 15% at part of the composite score because it is not um, a validated um, number. So far, our returning students, we combined these things, as it says in this box on the right, with academics being 50%, attendance 20%, discipline 15%, and risk factor 15% to create a single composite score for each of our elementary schools, both neighborhood and magnet. For new entrants, of course, we have a different problem, right? Because our new entrants don't generally look like their neighborhood school colleagues, right? They, they may live in, let's say, the Eagle Point area, but they're coming into our district uh, you know, at sixth grade. They're not the same as somebody who's been at Eagle Point for uh, K-5. So what Dr. Robin decided to do for them is to take a district-wide average of how new entrant sixth graders perform versus how with regular, I shouldn't call them regular, let's call them existing sixth grade graders perform. And he did find that district-wide on almost every category, on every category, they performed slightly worse. And so he, we use that percentage for each category to create what I'm gonna call a typical new entrant. And each of those little numbers that was represented for a new entrant was treated as a typical new entrant using that mathematical analysis of what a typical new entrant would be. It is not a perfect science. Nothing in here is a perfect science, but that was the best way we could think to deal with it um, and, and have it uh, look at a, um, something that would have some meaning for us. Um, I didn't read this note out, but it's here for you. I asked what's really in that risk score. It's all the things that you would expect, right? It's attendance. It's if you ever got held back a year. It's if you've got d discipline issues, if you've got an IEP, if you're ENL, if you've got, um, if you're noted as economically disadvantaged, all the things are in here um, in, and they have some mechanism for assigning points and whatnot so that they can identify their kids who they want to pay special attention to. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the lots and lots of words on the slide and brings us to slide 10, which is the additional considerations slide. I want to stress this, and I don't know if Dr. Robin was able to be here tonight, but he stressed this with us so much. Don't assume there's precision just because there's data points. Everything we've done is at best a very good estimate. But it's not, you know, none of us have a magic ball. We can only look at what's happened in the past and hope it is predictive of the future. They could be high, they could be low, we don't really know. I also want to identify that there are a lot of scenarios here. When you take it and you figure out, you use your old combinatorics, 12 schools going to three middle schools, that's over a half a million possible combinations. Most of them are ludicrous, right? Because one of the possible combinations is that every single school goes to Myers, right? Obviously, that's not balanced, right? So that 530,000 means a lot, is a lot. And many of them are co totally ridiculous. After we took the 530, and that this part is not in the slides. I think that was just an oversight on my part. I didn't uh, ask Ron to be sure that he conveyed this piece of it. We looked at only scenarios that would allow the range of enrollment from the lowest school to the highest school to be no more than 35, okay? And we did that twice. We did it once with dual at its current size, and then we did it a second time with dual at its larger size. Again, I don't know how else you do it because we have to deal with our situation we've got right now, which is dual is only generating 16 students a year. But very soon in, in real time, right a few years from now, when those kindergarten babies hit middle school, we're going to be looking at 32-ish, assuming the retention stays the same and nothing else happens and you know all the other things. Um, but so that's how we did it. When we did that, we were able to identify that there's really only a few hundred, about 320 scenarios that allow you to maintain that enrollment range in both um, scenarios, both uh, single dual and double dual. The other question 
um, the next thing that we did, and I'll just tell you how we got to this, and I'm going to go back to one more thing. Of those 318, it wasn't 320, it was 318, we took the 60 best ones based on the composite score. All right, so we took all of them, we lay them in a row based on the composite score, and we picked the top 60. If you're like a mathy person, you might be going, wow, there's a lot of multiples of six happening here. Why are there so many multiples of six? All these numbers are multiples of six. That is because for every scenario, every alignment of schools, you can move that group of elementary schools to any middle school, right? So we could take our current alignment, just imagine our very current alignment, the one that we all are familiar with, and we could just take all the students who currently go to Myers and send them to Hackett. We can take the Hackett students and send them to North Albany, and we can send the North Albany students and send them to Myers, right? The enrollment, the academic projection for that scenario will be identical to the current one, right? Because you're just taking the groups and moving them from school to school. And if you think about the way that plays out, you end up with six identical scenarios. And I've been calling that a set of scenarios, right? And that is why those multiples of six happen all the time. And one of the things that I know came up in one of the public comments and I've heard several times is, why did the scenarios come out that New Scotland Elementary didn't have like a balanced number of times that it was at each school? In the 60, it did, because the 60 was 10 sets, which means New Scotland was evenly at New North Albany, at Hackett and at Montessori. And we can pull, at Montessori, Myers. We can pull those 60 if you want to see them because it, it, we have all the possible combinations there. So what caused New Scotland to not be sort of equally balanced, it wasn't this cut that got us to 60. It was the next cut. Does that does that make sense? Okay, now i got to figure out where I am on the slides. Pertoni's like, where is she on the slides? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm still on slide 10. From that list of 60, the committee then narrowed down the list of potential scenarios to eight. And I remember when I first got on the board feeling very frustrated the data wasn't coming to me with more time. And I remember someone saying to me, it's happening in real time. You can't be frustrated that we're not getting you things earlier because we didn't have them earlier. And when I tell you this is happening in real time, this is happening in real time. Dr. Robin and I have been crunching data like crazy for two weeks trying to get these numbers down. We finally got the scenarios to the committee yesterday at four o'clock. They, yesterday? Yeah, today's on Thursday. They met at 6.30. So this is all happening precisely in real time. What's that? Tuesday. Sorry, Tuesday. We normally meet on Wednesday, but there was an art show that I had to go to at my house last night, which was fabulous, by the way. Um, so we met on Tuesday. Thank you. I thought I missed a day. But so Tuesday is when, when that went down. So that committee got the scenarios at four o'clock on Tuesday, and by Tuesday at nine, you know, we had tried to narrow down to a reasonable set of eight based on some other criteria. And now uh, we can talk about the criteria, but before I do that, I just want to re reinforce this point number at the very bottom of slide 10. Dr. Robin, who is a you know, PhD in this area, says, you can say with confidence that all 60 of these, and especially the eight, are among the very best options you have once you input in place that 35 enrollment cap, 35 range, they're the best. They are way better than what you've got now. What he doesn't feel comfortable saying is that the one that was at the top of the list is definitely better than the second one down, which is definitely better than the third one down, right? It's just there's not that much confidence in these numbers that you can use that tight sequencing. You can say for sure that number one is better than number 500, but one and eight, they're so good. They're all good. You should not get caught up in thinking about which one is quote unquote better for um, equity reasons that have to do with these internal items. There are equity issues that are different, right? That have to do with transportation and how much, how long you're on the bus and those kinds of things. There you can think about equity for each scenario, but within the building, the number of students who are at risk is going to be pretty comparable in each and every one of these scenarios that we've got in front of us. Okay, before we actually look at scenarios, and I know I just like talk and talk and talk, does anybody have questions about the process? The committee thought really hard and asked lots of questions. That's how we got all this questions about like refugees, the spells contain and all that. 
we, Dr. Robin and I didn't think about all that on our own. That was like iteratively working with the committee who would say, but wait, what about with the refugees? Sure. I just want to point out that when, we, when the committee got the list of 60 and was in this process of nailing it down to eight, this is all blinded. Nobody knew what schools were being involved. It was just numbers. So when I sent the spreadsheet that's on this slide 11, you see on slide 11, you've got all these pretty colors and then you've got the list of schools. When the committee first saw it, they didn't have the school names. They only had the scenario IDs and the numbers. Board Member Wilson. Thank you, and I'm not certain if it's more so a process question, but I believe it is. Um, do we have any understanding of, um, for example, we? I understand during the presentation you mentioned that rather than the school that you attend, the student's home address was prioritized. However, there are varying zip codes which have differing levels of housing stability. So we're using a snapshot and when and if the family moves, do they now attend or go to um, a different school, for example, versus using the home school, which is, of course, within a catchment area anyway, um, that determining your, your middle school is the question. So the, the answer is we looked at so, so there's two questions. One is an operational question. What happens to that individual child, right? And the second question is, like, how does that affect the model? Um, how it impacts the individual child, I'm going to leave for the superintendent to get somebody else to knows better than I. I think I know, but I don't want to mess it up. But in terms of how it impacts the enrollment, we looked at grades three through five for that. So it was, you know, we looked at everybody who's currently at, say, Eagle Point um, and looked at all those home addresses. So you, you're correct that if tomorrow it could be a slightly different set, right, for these transportation numbers, it might be a little different um, because there is a lot of transiency in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, one possible improvement to the model could be to go back farther. Um, but is, at some point, is, is that better, is that good projection for the future because things are changing so much is what's current. I think Dr. Robin generally wanted to look mostly at fifth graders thinking, that's the most stable, the most predictive, because it's the one we know the most about. Um, do you want somebody to answer the question about what happens to an individual child when they, um, if they, if their family moves within the district or out of district mid-year? It it depends on uh, what's going on, you know, because different families have different situations. But in theory, with regard to our regulation, a child can finish out the semester or finish out the quarter. Depending on when it is, they could finish out the year. So those are handled on an individual basis in alignment with the regulation. Mm -hmm. Board Member Smith. Thank you. So it, it might be a little early for this question, but I, I think it's a process one too. And it's uh, not only did the one of the commenters, public commenters, say something about the timing or the questioning, the speed at which we're moving. But then I also took from what you've said about when committee members receive certain information. So it has me sort of, and then now you're saying that they're down, you know, pretty much eight scenarios. I'm trying to get a sense of time. Um, is there some, can you just, I want to understand whether the committee thinks they've had sufficient time to look at everything. Are they confident in these I know you narrowed it from 60 down to eight. Um, do they need more time? What, what, what is all of, what's the impact of this issue of we didn't get things at a certain time, plus some people thinking we're moving too fast. I just want to understand that piece. I, I, I don't know what committee members we have on. I know that there was a couple that were planning to join virtually. I don't know if they have, want to speak to that. Oh, I see Dan Katz just popped in. Um, I don't know who else is here that could speak to their reaction about that. Mr. Katz? I think, I don't know if he's muted or if he's like super muted that there. I see uh, folks looking at him trying to get him unmuted. Ms. Harrell is also on. Ms. Harrell is there too? Ms. Harrell, can you unmute? Can you, is it, is that possible? Or type in the oh, chat. There we go. Yes, we can. And I finally was able to make it on with all my 
technology issues. <laughs> but I am here. So I think the question people wanted to ask, or were Member Smith wanted to ask, is whether, um, you know, given the short time frame that you had to experience the scenarios, whether that felt like enough time to think to think through all the nuances, or whether it it, it did not. I feel like it, for me, I can't speak obviously for any other committee member. It, I think we've had enough sufficient time to get to the point that we're at now. Um, what I relayed um, by email because of my technology issue that our meeting on Tuesday is that I still am looking forward to hearing what community and families have to say, which would then allow us even more time to look at these eight scenarios and not necessarily go completely backwards to the other 60, but is there anything else we need to consider? So I, I do feel like we've had at least enough time to get to where we are now, knowing we'll have a little bit more time to be able to look at the bigger picture as we get more information. Thank you, that was helpful. I want to do two things before we um, look to another committee member. One is, I thought maybe Superintendent Adams, if you'd be willing, we could just skip ahead to talk about the community process piece now and then come back. Is that okay with you? Because I think that's the question that um, Ms. Harrell was bringing up, which is like she was in, she's interested in having more opportunities to hear more from families. So if it's okay, um, um, Ms. Bowie, can you can please pass the scenarios to the community process slides? I, can I ask a question before the committee? Oh, sure. Process? Sorry, I apologize. Um, it kind of just in lieu of Vicki's question, but it's a tad bit different. I'm just wondering for the contingency that wants to delay, which I respect, or they, some people, for example, potentially may not even be aware and feel like, wait, this is too soon next year. I didn't know. What is to be gained from a delay? I'm wondering also because, or can we speak to that? Because if we have the real estate we have, the, like, it, does a delay make it so that we're delaying the decision we make in the question, and I, I don't know if that's a process question I either. I totally hear you. That's where I, I want to hold on yeah. that question until we get through okay. what Ms. Harrell was talking about, because I think that that's a big question, right? The whole board, I think, really wants to talk about that and really think it through. But first, let's get through the community process so that people understand what what the, the superintendent's plan is to collect that information, um, and then we'll come back to a couple of other things. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Bowie and Ms. So one of the things that we have talked extensively about with regard to uh, getting more community input, I'm going to refresh everyone's memory that we did do a survey in the beginning and we said even then that we would be going back out because we knew that certain communities were not highly represented. And so we wanted to get through this process and that's part of what would we be sharing out with our community. And so looking at this second phase, um, having people look at the criteria, prioritize the criteria, prioritize the criteria in terms of uh, the scenarios that we have, et cetera, and, and making sure that we are hearing the voices of our community. And we've stated that all along. We started that at the very beginning. We talked about having the forums with the community. Uh, we just needed to get to a point to be able to say, what is it that we're sharing with our community? And we are at that point now. And so if you look at the screen, we have on Monday the 14th from 6.30 to 7.30. These are our virtual meetings. Uh, Tuesday, and we're looking at Arbor Hill, Sheridan Prep, and Schuyler. Tuesday the 15th, 6.30 to 7.30, Ash, New Scotland, and Pine Hills. Wednesday the 16th, 6.30 to 7.30, Eagle Point, dual language, Montessori, and then Thursday the 17th, 6.30 to 7.30, Delaware, Giffen, and Toast. Uh, Albany International Center parents and guardians may participate in the, in the forum that's most convenient. Um, you can visit the school's page, your school's page at albanyschools.org and link to watch the meeting for your school. Uh, we will also have our feedback form available so that we can take questions during the meeting. And so those are the virtual community meetings. If you go to the next slide, then we do have two at this time. That doesn't mean that we won't have more, but at this time we have two in-person meetings scheduled for February 28th at Arbor Hill from 6.30 to 7.30, and then Tuesday, March 1st from 6.30 to 7.30 at Giffen Memorial. Uh, that gets us through getting up to the break, and then right when we come back, 
and it still gives us time to have additional in-person or virtual meetings, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we had those available. Uh, the surveys will be shared um, at the at the end of the meeting, uh, and then we'll have it available so that anyone can fill out the survey when they uh, so choose. But we will definitely have it so that if people are filling out the survey and they have questions, that they can do it and ask questions so that we can be there to facilitate that. So I appreciate you guys letting me take that out of order. I just think it's important contextual information that um, the board is not planning tonight to discuss which of these scenarios we like. Like that's not what we're here to do tonight because we want to hear from the community before we have any um, reaction to any of the eight scenarios. Um, I also want to remind everyone, which I think everyone knows, um, but just to be sure, all committee recommendations are always purely recommendations to the board, right? The board holds the ultimate authority by means of having been elected. And so if one of these eight upon further reflection after community feedback, we go, oh, well, this scenario is practically perfect, but what if we did this other variation on it? That would be permitted by our process, right? We are the elected authorities and that is what that is within our realm. We do want to honor the work of the committee. It would be really troubling to me if we were to select a scenario that was completely at odds with things that the committee had said. But I don't think that would happen because I think that the process has been so, you know, sort of planned throughout the thing that at least when you get to the 60 and then the eight, you can see what happened and we can we can talk about that. So I just wanted to keep that as part of people's understanding. Um, so again, I don't want to talk about which scenario you like, but I do think it's important to talk about what other um, criteria you might need, what other information you might need. Now, we heard from Ms. Harrell. I didn't know if there was any other committee members that wanted to speak to that point of whether it felt like they had sufficient information and time. Um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if people have things to say, I wanted to give them the opportunity to speak. Um. I don't think that there, there's never enough time, right? We could spend, I mean, this is such a complex topic and we could talk about it for years. So on the one hand, no, it would be lovely to spend more time really, really just like immersing ourselves in this data, but kids are only kids and for a period of time and we have to move the process forward. And I think the conversation that I hear you saying is gonna happen later on in this meeting is important about um, about when this when is this new pattern that we all decide on collectively as a community when it's implemented. I also think it's important to separate out the amount of time the committee has to think about scenarios from the amount of time the community has to give input. And that's the part, the piece, um, the element of this process that we're entering now. And, and is it really its own separate question is do we have enough time mm -hmm. to do that? Because that's obviously really important to all of us. Thanks, Dorian. Um, Ms. Salat, does anyone else, any other committee members, Dan, were you able to figure out how to get unmuted? Is that a thing you can do? Did you want to speak? He says, if you want to put any comments in the chat, we can also see them there. If, if you're struggling to get unmuted, that's also an option. Um, okay, so I'm going to take, while he's thinking about what's going in the chat, if we can go back to the scenarios, I just want to walk people through the spreadsheet and then we can talk about what information we might need that we don't have or how we might want to interpret this information. So this incredibly colorful spreadsheet um, gives you the information that is like a consolidated summary of what the committee looked at. I'm just going to talk you through how it works. The very top row is light blue. You see that top row is light blue. Um, everybody, if, if it's hard to read, also on the agenda, just in board docs, you can actually get to the PDF so you can make it bigger if you if you need to. The top row is the current feeder pattern, so that should look very, very familiar to you, right? North Albany, the Arbor Hill, Sheridan Prep, and Schuyler Achievement Academy. Myers is Montessori, Ash, Pine Hills, and Giffen. Hackett is New Scotland, Toast, Eagle Point, Delaware Community School, and Dual. I do want to point out that Dr. Um, Robin was able to subtract the Dual data from the old DCS history. So whenever we say DCS, we mean DCS less Dual, right? So DCS is its own thing, dual is its own thing. Um, the next two columns tell you how many changes this particular scenario results in. Needless to say, the current feeder pattern results in no changes in schools and no changes for students. But as you look underneath that, you'll see the number of school changes and the number of fifth graders who would go to a different middle school than they currently think that they would go to based on the current feeder, feeder pattern. Does that make sense? Okay, the colors range from green to yellow, or actually 
if you were looking at all 60, they'd go from green to red. With um, one change, there were no one changes. I think the fewest was four, right? Four being bright green and 12 being red because they'd be put all the versions of the set, right? The set has six, there's six of centers in a set. Some of the sets had a version that resulted in 12 school changes, like literally every single school having to change. Those would have been colored red. So you're only seeing ones that are sort of pale yellow, pale green, because those were the ones that rode to, rose to the top. The next two columns are your enrollment columns. Enrollment range single dual, dual and enrollment range double dual. Range means you take the biggest school and you subtract the smallest school, and that gives you the, the range in school sizes. Our current range, based on the predicted model, this isn't the range of the current actual students, this is based on the predicted model, is 200 for single dual and then 248 for double dual because ultimately dual is going to generate 16 more child, children a year, three times three grades, that's your 48, right? So that's why that those two numbers are different. And that's what you see going down. Again, darker green means narrower range, which is good, right? The darker yellow, there aren't that many yellowish ones because we only selected narrow things. Um, is is less good. The blue bars just count students. It's just another way. If you're not good at color, you can see that um, the, the width of the bar represents the number of students in the range. The next column is your composite range. The composite, again, is that crazy math that took the academics, the attendance, the discipline data, and the risk data and merged all into one big number. And you can see that there is a, a variety from, I think we've got, what, 0 0.99, 0 0.92 down to 1.92 here compared to the current, which is 4.34. So you can see, again, smaller numbers better because it means the range is narrower, which was the objective was to have equitable schools, more similar levels of risk and um, more civil, similar levels of resource need per student. So they're all way better than the um, current. You'll notice that the 1.92 um, looks a little bit weird because it's like yellow and all the other ones are green. That is the committee um, trying to find scenarios that, that seemed appealing that did not send New Scotland Elementary to North Albany. Because the committee was fully aware when they looked at this, because as Dr. Tatour said, when they saw the spreadsheet first, it was blind. They did not know what school was in what elementary, in middle school. And so they made a selection, and I think their first cut was a few number of changes, like seven or under changes, and then they looked at these columns way on the right that have to do with transportation, trying to reduce our long walkers, because we know that that's just really unfortunate when we have these kids walking a long way. And they came up with, I think, 12 or 15 um, that they thought they could tolerate. And then we looked at the school names. So they didn't know what schools, that was just what the data led to and it was like oh wow like only three out of like a, the 12 or the 15 had new scotland not going to north albany now i haven't had the time since tuesday to dig into why that is i think it's because this the community was looking for a few numbers of changes right and new scotland is a huge school it has an overwhelmingly positive um score in terms of its academics so once you um if you don't move new scotland out of hackett you have to do a whole lot of other things to try and counterbalance it. That's my gut about why it happened that way. But I don't really know, and I can figure that out because it was definitely striking. But that's why that 1.92 is, is so different than the others because the committee went, wait, this is crazy. We have to look at scenarios that New Scotland would continue. And again, remember what Dr. Robin said. He said, you can't worry too much about like, these are the top 60 out of 320 to begin with. So. The 192 looks low, but it's it's not it's not something you should be get overly concerned about. Okay, so that's the composite range column. Now we've got two sets of transportation data. These are general ed students by home address. The transportation department found the mileage for each and every existing grade three through five students. This is not like hypothetical ranges. These are actual students in the actual elementary schools right now and measured how far their commute would be from their home address. Again, you, Tabitha, your point about transiency is well taken. It's just their current home address to each of the middle schools. And then we defined it and divided it into three categories. Closer than a mile to school, a mile to a mile and a half, and a mile and a half and up. And those three categories are based on our real busing situation, right? We know 
that we right now in the city of Albany only have busing for children who live more than a mile and a half from school. Otherwise, you have to get yourself to school somehow. You can buy your own bus pass, your parents can drop you, you can walk, something, but we cannot provide busing less than one and a half miles. We as a board have considered that multiple times. We can consider that again. I remind you that every time we've looked at that, it's been a roughly three to five million dollar price tag, which is roughly a three to five percent property tax increase. Right? On top of what other property tax increase we would need just to provide the program. So it's a very, very considerable expense. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying we can't do that. I'm just saying that's you know, that's why historically we have not done it. And so that's why we went with one and a half and over. And then I think we just decided less than one felt like, you know, a reasonable walk for a middle school, right? Tough today. A mile is, is not an outrageous walk for a, for a middle schooler. Um, and then the, the difference was the one to one and a half, which we in our minds have been calling the long walk zone, right? These are kids who are not eligible for busing and they don't live really comfortably close. Now, you know, a mile and a half is not a terrible walk from school, um, in, you know, in, when it's not raining, snowing, slushing, horrible, um, but it's, it's not great. Um, and so we totaled those up and we did it twice. The orange column is all students and the pink column is economically disadvantaged students because we're always trying to look at things with an equity lens and trying to make sure that we were being cognizant of the disparate income impact of transportation challenge on families with means and families without means. Um, and so that, I think, brings me to the end of how the spreadsheet was constructed. And so what I'm hoping that you all can do is, is to talk a little bit about like what are the kind of factors you think committee community is going to share or want to know about to help the district think about data that they might need to provide for us to make a better decision. I know that one of the factors is transportation. Is that what you wanted to talk about? No. So I did ask the superintendent already this morning and I and she said that she could um, ask someone to do this to create a map of each scenario, which students um, in scenario 25828A, that's the top one, which if you mapped all those students where they actually live so that we could get a sense because the transportation is very complicated, right? Because it's not just how far they live, which is all we've got in these columns. It's where are the bus routes? What would a tripper bus look like? All of those things we cannot do from this data, but perhaps we could from a scatter plot. And, and the committee already looked at that. One of the first things they looked at was maps with little dots on them for each elementary school as they tried to figure this out. So that, that data exists, it just needs to be built back in. Um, so that's the kind of question that we, like, what else might we want to know? Dr. Chitor, I see your finger yeah. on the microphone. I, I just wanted to point out that these 60 scenarios that we started with are all better than what we have right now. Okay? So that composite score that you see for what is current, 4.3 something, every one of the 60 was better than what we have. Hey, Ms. Bowie, could you pull up the actual document instead of the um, PowerPoint for me? Because that actually has that information on it. You know, and so when you're looking at, when, when Anne was talking about, you know, we had scenarios that were 12 changes, even those 12 changes were better than what we have right now. We try to make, minimize all of those factors. The other thing I think, I don't know if Anne, you mentioned it, is that one of the cutoffs that we had was we made a composite score two and less. So that got rid of a whole bunch of those 60s scenarios. That's right, The top, these 60 were the top, I ranked them by composite score and I took the top 12, a uh, top 12 sets, 60 scenarios, no, 10 sets, 60 scenarios, which gives us, was the 1.99 cutoff. But if you look at the document that the that, um, board clerk is pulling up, um, which is really tiny, um, but you can make it larger on your screen. And it, this is just on the agenda. Everybody can see this. It says all much better on the on the enrollment range and on the composite range. They're all much better. All of the 60 were much better, right? And then these eight were pulled almost entirely from the top half of the 60, the exceptions being those ones that got added in because they were hunting for new Scotland options. And the only thing that was a little surprising when I went and looked these at these is that 
most of them do have more long walkers than what we have now. Um, there are not many scenarios that result in fewer long walkers, which is not a surprise because we know that North Albany is not convenient. Um, so that is uh, that is a big challenge. There are a few, two, that are um, fewer long walkers, and there's I think one that's almost comparable, um, but mostly they're 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 not as good on that category, which is disappointing. That was not something I used to cut the initial 60. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about transportation? Right. I mean, I, I, I think it's important for us to get that in data, which, uh, which I'm sure we'll get soon, in terms of what is it, what are the current routes now, and what new routes we would need for any of these eight scenarios to make the decision, especially in light of how long would it take. Right, because people might prefer to have a neighborhood school, like a walking. It might take, let's say, it might take you 45 minutes to walk to one of the middle schools. And it might, you might find that the bus takes you an hour and a half. And parents should and, you know, would prefer that maybe, okay, you know, to come rain or snow or whatever, I'd rather have my child walk for 45 minutes than to be on the bus. But those are personal choices. But having that information out there will be useful for people as we're doing these forums to make those kind of choices for themselves and, let, and inform us as to, hey, we prefer this instead of that. And that might change some of these assumptions that we are making um, where we are trying to decrease the number of walkers, but maybe the number of walkers may not change because people are choosing to walk, um, especially in, in, in lieu of the current COVID situation where we can't find drivers. That's in a, in, you know CDTA or for student or you know, other districts are suffering too. We we did, you know we're hoping that CDTA will have routes and we CDTA will have drivers. We don't know. We're assuming that they will, but if a bus is delayed or the student misses the bus, then they have to take some other means of transportation, not a tripper bus that goes directly from that pickup spot to the school, but their own way, and that might involve two you know, two connections, and that is something to think about. But while we think about that, we should also look at the current situations where students do come in from the other part of town to Myers. And so, you know, some of these issues exist even today, and, but we need to have that information that so parents can make their choice. Board Member Great. Uh, thanks. thanks for bringing that up, Dr. Tutura. I think it's important. I shouldn't do that. I think it's important to know from a transportation perspective, you know, how many drivers and how many routes would be required for each of these options to know which is most affordable and which is most feasible given a driver shortage. Your question about tripper buses did bring up something and, and I'm curious to confirm when we run tripper buses now, we don't set it up so any sixth grader that's eligible for busing has to like make connections. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. That's there, not correct. there are plenty of tripper kids who need to make a connection, um, particularly if you live like way out Western Avenue. The tripper buses only go out as far as Brevator, I think. So the only way for you to get on to school is either drive, walk, or walk up to the bus like the number 10, take the number 10 down, and try and catch the tripper because where Myers is, and I only know this because I'm I have had children at Myers, where Myers is, the only bus that goes there is the 106 which does not like go any place useful if you live out, up in Outer Western. So those kids either carpool or a few of them have tried to take the number 10 into town, then take the tripper bus from, from where it starts over to Myers. But like, think about this, you're 12 years old, you have to make a transfer that only runs once a day. Like it's very, very, very difficult. So it's most families choose to find some other solution. Um, but this is, you know, this is true currently, and it's going to be true, um, you know, in the new world order too. Again, we can attempt to increase our transportation budget to mitigate for that, because that it would not be illegal for us to spend money on, right? It is illegal for us to spend transportation money to bus children who live less than one and a half. Um, but it is not against the law. It may be budgetarily challenging for us to increase the um, the routes for kids who live out farther. But that, that's something we could certainly ask the superintendent to do some analysis and figure out what the budget implications would be of improving that. That's It's helpful to know because so many of the bus routes in Albany are east-west and so much of what we're considering is moving kids north and south. And I think that in part has people concerned just because 
there are fewer reliable bus routes that go that way. I, I do want to clarify that, though. What, what Ann said is correct. However, when you're when you're on a tripper bus, there are no connections. The tripper bus goes uh, runs the route and goes directly to school. It doesn't. We don't have connections built into the tripper routes. Uh, there probably are uh, children. Well, there definitely are children in the city who who t take a connector bus to get to where the tripper bus is convenient for them to get on it. But the trippers themselves do not have connections uh, built into the routes. Thank you. Other thoughts? I know you know we, we've asked for the scatter plots. Now we're looking for more information about transportation and transportation budgetary constraints and what we could do to, to mitigate some of this. Keeping in mind what Dr. Chatur said, which is even all the money in the world does not resolve our problem if we do not have drivers, right? We're already facing that. I think many of you know that the Bethlehem board is seriously considering or may have already passed um, an increase in their walk zone to match ours at 1.5. Um, they used to be smaller, I don't know what their old one was, but they have they have gone to 1.5 because they simply don't have enough drivers. Um, and we know the lack of drivers is impacting us right now. So uh, we hope that that will mitigate over time, but there's no um, there's no guarantee. Um, you know, we may just be in a new world order in, in terms of bus drivers, I don't know. Um, who else, anybody want to speak to Ms. Wilson? I'm almost leaning towards the new world order of bus drivers because um, knowing that there are 2050 goals for us to like reduce our carbon footprint as a society and you know just thinking about just the carbon footprint of like traversing the city and knowing that in Albany actually having this many buses is a new phenomenon there was actually a part of the town um, in the south end that did not have a bus line that during that long strip all the way down to South Pearl for a historically long time so understanding people's concerns and also um, understanding that there was something that went viral the other day about people shocked with moving from New York City where students are on like two subway trains and then here in, you know, upstate, we drop our students right to the door. So it's like there is a dichotomy there to understand. And I do want to hear the wisdom from the community about, and you know, any insights they have, because there may be someone out there who has something that we can like, you know, pull in that we can consider as also. But that is something I wanted to interject is that, yes, um, transportation is that equity issue, of course, and there's also the inclement weather. There is the attendance aspect. I don't know if there's a correlation between distance and attendance, but that's something to consider also. We know there's a correlation between weather and attendance for sure, right? We're, we're very aware that that's an impact, so it's interesting. Ms. Smith. Yeah, I'm just back on Dr. Chatur's uh, uh, comments around, uh, you know, maybe some parents with neighborhood schools. I guess I'm concerned about that focus because like, you don't really have middle schools that are neighborhood schools. Or I mean, it's not a thing. Is that, am I correct about that? I mean, like, North Albany is not really a neighborhood school. Do you mean? I'm just, I'm just, it's the use of the term, I guess. Um, did you mean to say middle school for neighborhood schools? Okay. Can you just... Can you just so, repeat so what you were saying? I'm, I, just I, I wish I remember what exactly what he said. <laughs> but, yeah, well, I can't review it while in the meeting. Ah, right. So, what I was saying is, right now people have bought a house based on some school, elementary, whatever, you, and assume that they're going to go to school A, B, C, or D, right? And that school A, B, or C, depending on what distance from them, they either have a bus or they don't have a bus. And here the assumption we're making is that if you don't have a bus, maybe you're dropping your kid, or you're paying for a bus pass yourself out of your pocket, or your kids are walking. We want to reduce the number of people who are walking between 1 and 1.49 miles. Right? That's what, what the assumption is. But it could so well be that now you get a bus because you're going to, instead of going to school A, you're going to school B. Right? But that walk was 45 minutes because it's closer to my neighborhood. I can't really, I mean, I'm going, getting a bus now to school B, and that bus route, bus ride is taking me twice the amount of time. So now, even though I could have walked or dropped my kid, I am in a position where I have to drive longer or not be in a position to walk, but if I miss that trip or bus, have to take two city buses to get to, to, to school B. That is people's choices, right? People might be okay with it. People may not be okay with it. And they may, so while we are trying to reduce the walk, people might prefer the walk. 
to a you're saying year. you think that there are some people, and again, right. we're asking for community input, who right. would rather be at 1.49 than at 1.51. Right. I mean, Hackett is Hackett is in a, is in a position where it's like centrally located, lots of bus routes, lots of, but Myers is on one end, not Albany is on the other. So somebody is going to be affected anyways. And, and again, think, all of these things that came up, it was it was amazing that. You know, we did not have any names, and it was the data that, and our assumptions that we thought that these would be important, pulled up these things. So any of these are better than what we have right now, and the community input is what would actually influence what choices should we be looking at. What you know, what what we think is important may not be important to the community. We don't know that. So, on that point, you're talking. I was going to. If that's okay. okay. Go ahead. I guess, and I think this is sort of the same kind of thing you're saying is that. Um, I think every family is going to face the I wish my middle school were closer challenge, right? I can't think of any family that's going to say, I wish my my school was a way farther away, right? Because every family is going to be challenged by having to figure out that transportation if their kid misses the tri the, misses the um, tripper bus or whatever. And I'm always sensitive to the fact that there's, there's a... I wish I were a social scientist so I could speak to it, but there's a, a an effect of being in a certain community and you feel that community and you don't necessarily feel the community that you don't see. And that's, I'm really, we really, I feel, need to steel ourselves against that because it, this can't be like a, a vote about who is who is the loudest. Like that, because every, I can't imagine, and I shouldn't try and imagine other people's scenarios, everybody has to make their own decisions, but if we only hear from, and this is why I really appreciate the superintendent's extra, extreme commitment to doing these focus groups, and I know the principals are going to be out there saying, please come to the focus groups, parents, because we need to hear your voices, because we need to hear from everyone, um, and we know that that we don't, we often hear from the same, um, the same schools, parents representing the same schools over and over again. Uh, Board member Krejci, did you have something on that point? I guess I had something on that point and just the point about uh, the people talking about it's too soon and it's too fast because I understand that we're, we don't have a very long time frame in terms of having the focus groups and making a decision, but in terms of the comments, well, it's too soon to get used to the idea of my kid going to a different middle school than the one they expected to go to. Well, we've been discussing for five years, we're going to put together a feeder committee and we're going to uh, equalize, or I should say, we, we're going to change our feeder pattern to bring about greater equity. So no one who's no one whose kids are in elementary school now should have counted on or could have banked on. Yes, my kid's going to go to the same middle school that they've always been to. That's not something that somebody should have. Uh, I will only say in fairness to the community that we did originally think the construction was going to take longer. So when we originally had the bond referendum, to pay for North Albany. We thought that it was going to take an extra year and we were not going to be until 23-24, right? So this is a year earlier, which is a good thing because it meant the construction was less expensive and it meant that we were able to mitigate what has, when we've spent practically the entire time I've been on the board, we have spent trying to get to a place where we had equitable middle schools with three grades in them, right? Like this, the fact that we had some of our sixth graders and some fifth grade um, elementary schools was was really creating problems in our district um, that we can talk about some other time, but it's taken a long time to get there. But it is it is a true thing that when we first announced and 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 got the voters to um, support the North Albany program, it was supposed to be 23-24. But well, it's good that we're going to be able to solve the problem earlier, but um, but it is a surprise. I see Board Member Almanyawi, who has not spoken as much, and then Board Member Wilson, if that's okay with you guys. I just want to make a uh, two comments, two points regarding one time and then two, uh, the 60 um, options, the eight options. So uh, first of all, the time aspect, for me, I really do hope that we get these focus groups so we get uh, more community input in the next uh, few weeks, because that will really, um, is there is there an echo? Am I good? Okay. Um, so I I really want to see that, and it will absolutely weigh on my mind in terms of how we go. Um, 
but regardless, I do want to put my my vote of confidence in this process in that um, the data we are crunching is going to I mean the results these eight um, options are all more equitable than what we've got going right now and as far as um, what we think as a community and uh, what we do as a community we I want everyone to rest assured that these options are in fact um, be, like will lay out better outcomes for our schools and our students and that is something that I do believe the time aspect it's unfortunate that we don't have as much time as we'd like and I really do think we need to work fast um, in order to get the word out so yeah, I assume that the principals will have those focus group dates tomorrow um, to, to try and drive some attendance that's who we worked with to get them set up so they're going to be advertising them so that we can and we're also working with our community schools coordinators so i i mean we have them scheduled we're doing the work so i would think that we are absolutely taking it seriously as we have from the very beginning of the process in saying that we would be engaging our community so i'm yep I sounds like we're headed on the right track i would track. hope that that's clear Let's see, I, I know board member Wilson was supposed to be next, but Ms. Smith, can you hold, can you yield for her or? It's very brief, I promise, okay. I'm the sorry. Okay, two of you guys can arm And I want to, um, for one, I guess, to, Hassan says something similar that I wanted to address, but I also wanted to state that I know board member Krejci is basically saying that, um, you know, we're definitely not rushing and this, we don't mean to blindside folks, but I don't think, um, and I don't think you're saying that people who don't know or unawares are negligent. There's like, um, and I think Ms. Farrell spoke to that, so I'll let her come off of mute also to say it herself. But I think there's studies around poverty in the brain, and you just simply don't have the capacity to process things that are happening, even if you knew for the five years. So it's sort of like it's, you know, it doesn't permeate every community the same. So, and I don't think you're saying that, but I, you know, you know what I mean. But I just wanted to make sure that it landed on everybody. That's not what you meant, because there are people who won't know things. There are people who don't know things about our government, about our local government that they just don't know, and it's not something you're doing deliberately. And I don't think you meant that. No, no, that's not what I meant. It was more that I was saying, do you need more than six months to prep your kid about what middle school they're going to? I mean, people are getting into colleges now that have, you know, less time to figure out how to pack up their stuff and move across the country. So I don't know that you need more than six months to figure out to do that sort of um, orientation. But no, but it, I think sometimes yeah. if, if it's going to impact you and you don't have a car or, you know, or if you have multiple students. So it, I, I'm, that's why I said I have sensitivity to the people who have feel like, why don't we wait? And that's why I wanted to know more about the potential for waiting. But that's why I also entertain the part about if we wait, are we not just rolling up the same decision because we have only this, we have a certain capacity that we're at and we only have, we have the buildings we have. So it's not like the different config that we've arrived at the best statistical configurations and the superintendent ensured the process was transparent and very inclusive. And and also um, we weren't rushing. So I, I appreciate what I'm you meant. Said. I didn't mean to I didn't mean to sound insensitive to parents it's because I know when you know when, when things change, it is difficult, and especially now with so many things going on, it is traumatic to have things change unexpectedly. Thanks. I appreciate that, and I don't think you meant that. I just didn't want it to be a thing where it sounded that way. So, All right, sorry. Ms. Smith. Yeah, thank you both because that's I was kind of had an ouch there as my, myself. I think we should never be people should know, even if it was something we told them yesterday. Let's just continue to get the word out. And on that note, what I was going to say is I personally, Superintendent, I, I would be happy to be at a school after school or in the morning greeting parents and students, you know, handing out a flyer if, if need be. Uh, I know you've got pretty much all of that in place, but if there's something that I can personally do to interact with families to make sure they have the word out, I want to do that. Okay, so um, I will make that time. Okay, thank you. I wanted to point out two other criteria that have come. Oh, board member Mann, I'm sorry. Just trying to formulate my comment. Um, a part of me worries that we're moving very quickly. And, uh, you know, and I, I do like the way uh, Ms. Wilson phrased it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like this dilemma, do we move quickly, you know, but um, I just kind of wanted to put that out there. 
And that's a um, that's a big concern of mine with the whole process, which is a very, very, very beautiful and transparent process. I love the way all this went down. The fact that we use data, uh, but uh, but I I worry about the pace that we're moving. So and so it's just a statement, and you know I'll look to right. be back from the community. I see gentlemen, gentlemen here first, Dr. Chitor, then Board Member Almanyawi, then Ms. Smith. So you know. We raised this question about why do we need to move so fast for the upcoming year? Why not wait another year while we are doing committee? I know I personally asked that question because I was wondering too. Should we wait? Should we push this decision to next year? And correct me if I'm wrong, Supanee. You explained to us that what is the, the, the current situation that is is not is inequitable. It's wrong, right? And we want to fix those and not toss, you know, kick the can down the road. At the same time, we have three schools. We have North Albany, which is about 400 kids or so, and lots of space now the construction will be done. And we have Hackett, which is bursting the scene, followed by Myers. So there's inequity in, even in those things, where the kids who are going to Hackett and Myers have a different form of inequity. Right? They are not getting the attention that they could get if we were equally distributed. The resources also can be equitably distributed. So one of the things that, that I want to point out that we're looking at equity, right? Not equal, but equity. So if North Albany is a third middle school and people are worried that, you know, uh, it's a new school, that's not what the equity plus is going to do. If more resources are needed, if more triple buses are needed to get kids from point A to point B, if they're in that school, that's what would be done. But this whole process, I think, has been, I mean, it's been very unbiased. And and that's what I like about it. And if the if the cards so fall that your child happened, you thought we were going to school A and now goes to school B, but it makes sense for the district and your student as part of this district, I think it's a good thing. Maybe we want all our kids to be good. Hassan, board member Almiali. Thanks, Dr. Tutur. Um actually I just wanted to comment just on that. Um that uh we really uh, for this plan to succeed we're going to need the community buy-in um, and I do worry that if we don't get community buy-in that the plan um, will end up having unintended consequences and that um, the projections or forecasts uh, would be skewed because of counter actions by our community so um, it's it's very complex. Um, however, if we don't have community buy-in, I don't think, regardless of how good our plan is, it may not succeed. That's my concern. And then one more thing. Uh, can Vicky go because she's been waiting? Board member Smith? Go ahead, Dr. Shatur. I'll come after you. <clears throat> I just want to remind people that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, Hackett was not in a good place, right? When my child was in an elementary school and he was going to go to Hackett, my wife and I had the same conversation. Are we doing the right thing? It was a failing school. It was under um, receivership. And things are like night and day now. Right? So given the right resources and the right systems working with them, things can be fixed. And that's what we are trying to do. Board member Smith. So um, I just wanted to come back to, can we, if we've got a uh, the district superintendent and the principal, they have a plan for the forums. I'm not sure where we would go right now on this discussion of do we are we moving too quickly or are we not. Let's get to next week where we do have the input and just keep kind of evaluating as as we're moving along. Um, and that's why I'm saying, you know, if if the superintendent, if, if we need extra hands, you know, because I, I want to see our teachers in the classroom, our community engagement people doing what they need to do. But if like I can help free up some time and you know lend a hand to hand out flyers and talk to folks to say well, we really need your input, then I'm going to do that. So I I want to I'd like to move away if we can from that discussion. The other thing that I'm not sure of, which is I think Madam President is where you started is what other issues do we think the community uh, has in mind? I'm going to say I, I can't speak for that. I want to hear that and I don't want to pretend that I know something that I don't know. So I, another reason to let's get 
The yep. forum's underway. Begin so to get I, the feedback. I, I want to bring us back to the uh, question which I started with, which was what other information might we, might we need from the district because they need we, they need to be working on that at the same time as the forums. Um, and the two pieces that have come up repeatedly, which I know the superintendent knows there's nothing nothing surprising here, but I just want to remind you all is um, siblings. Right, and I know that that data was constructed once, and we're going to reconstruct it. Superintendent, and I talked about this this morning. It's not a lot of kids, right? It's only sixth graders who have a current fifth grade or fourth grade sibling, and seventh graders who have a current fifth grade sibling, right? Those are those would be the the two groups of people that would be impacted, and so we we do need to know how many individual children would be impacted by each scenario. I don't think we should use it to define not by each scenario in general, how many siblings there would be, because I don't think we can use it to pick a scenario, but we might use it to decide that we are going to provide an, a sibling preference opportunity um, during this transition period, right? I don't know if we can do that. It would depend on the um, large, you know, the, the quantity of people, because it could really skew our um, metrics. Um, we'll just have to see what that looks like. And I also wanted to remind people that there is um, an open enrollment process. Um, Ms. McKenna has spoken about multiple times. She can certainly do that again. That exists at the middle school level. Um, and so that is also for students who want to request an open enrollment to a different middle school. In general, in our you know, most recent lived experience, it has been more theoretical than practical because our schools have been, several schools have been um, over capacity. So you could ask to go to Hackett, but there's not room at Hackett, right? So, but in this scenario, there would, presumably be more flexibility, but not infinite flexibility, right? Once classes are full, we need to balance our students among schools. So the siblings and open enrollment. Um, and then the other piece I just wanted to um, just remind people, which I think Dr. Tutor mentioned about, is that, you know, North Albany is still under construction. The project is not done. So we, we, I hear I hear people talking about, like, are we moving too fast? Should we go too slow? Like, how, how should we do this? Do people need more time to prepare? Hopefully the project is going to come in on time, right? That would be a, that is the one other thing that's completely outside our control. Um, as far as I know, the construction is is relatively on schedule. I know facilities committee has been watching it carefully, but you know, stuff happens in the construction world. So I just think that's something that we should should keep our um, our mental energy on as well. Um, so uh, we also um, have heard a couple of. Um, a couple of other things that I had community members say to me, um, which again, I don't know this will come out of the forums. This is just things that actually committee members have said to me is, um, should we try and make North Albany as best as possible, right? If, you, if, if we're going to have three equal schools, should we try and make North Albany best among equals? Um, so that if people, so that people have no doubt, because I do think part of this is um, what I call the lack of imagination for people. I think when people look at these scenarios, their process is going to be first to look at their elementary school. Where's my elementary school? Oh, it's at North Albany. Well, I can't send my kid to North Albany. It's going to take them a minute to realize that going to North Albany, like let's just suppose my kid currently goes to um, dual and I'm, I'm looking at the top scenario. I would be also going to North Albany with the New Scotland families, right? So it takes like that's two steps. First step is where's my school going? Second step is who else will be there with me? Third step is what's the school that I'm leaving gonna look like, right? Because the, it's not really the same because I'm not at Hackett anymore, but neither is New Scotland. So it's just like a totally different school. So I think people need a little time to, to process that. And I also think that um, this community member said, or this committee member said to me, maybe we ought to make it really clear that of the three, the one at North Albany is, you know, a tiny smidge better because these are ranges, right? The fact that that, com that composite says 1.4 means that there's a, a range between the lowest and the highest school of 1.4. And so looking for ranges where North Albany is at the top of the range. I'm not saying we should do that. I'm just saying that's what somebody told me. And then also I do want to um, share that I have heard from a committee member about the, you know, the very serious challenges that, um, you know, transition, challenge, challenge, not the, word, the big transition that Dual has been through in the last year and that we'd be looking for a second big transition for them. So that I thought was, that's a slightly different to me than what I think every single school is gonna say, which is, I don't wanna change. I wanna stay where I am. I like my school, I like my teachers. Uh, I think that's gonna be the general theme, but I do think that it's fair to say that um, 
you know, dual has been through a very big transition this year. So um, I think I'm not saying we have to take it into account. I just think it's, it is a different, categorically different thing than just, I like my school and I want to stay there. So the, those were the, my other things that are not about fast or slow. Board member on Miami. Uh, just about the sibling um, matters. So I think what you were referring to might be different than what I'm thinking. And I just want to just casually mention it as something that uh, was brought to me by a community member is that if one of their children is in elementary school and it's in one end of the city and uh, they planned for their lives to be on this end of the city and that they would take their child to the middle school um, right next to that elementary school so that their commute and their drop off would be cohesive. Now they're basically splitting up which um, I think it might be a little bit different than the sibling uh, matter that you were talking about. Yeah, that is different, and I do understand it. It's sort of like the toast hackett um, kind of um, scenario because they're so, so close. Got it. Okay, I hear you. That's an interesting, another interesting take on it. Anyone else have things like that that they want to raise? Otherwise, I think we are pretty close to done. Done? Are we done? Um, and then we will come back. A week from tonight, are we going to be able to meet a week from tonight or will we have to wait till the next? Because we did have a special, Superintendent and I will talk offline. We do have on the calendar a special meeting for feeder for February 17th. Um, but if we don't have anything new to discuss because we need to collect the rest of the forum feedback, then so you and I will talk offline and we'll make a plan. Okay. A plan will be forthcoming after we think about that a little bit. Thank you guys for this really informative discussion and I appreciate your letting me like eat most of the airtime and, and talk a lot, but I hope that you all felt that you got to say what you felt you needed to say. Yeah, exactly. All right. So that brings us to the end of the feeder alignment conversation and miraculously we're still ahead of schedule and our next discussion item is going to be the grants and program development division update. Superintendent. Thank you so very much, Madam President, members of the board. At this time, uh, we have our division update from our Grants and Program Development Division. And Mrs. Eileen Leffler is on the screen and ready to share her division update. So thank you so very much, Mrs. Leffler. Good evening. I'm happy to be here to provide the update for the Grants Division. You're all familiar with this slide. The Grants Division supports the district vision, mission, and goals. The specific guiding principles for the Grants Division include the following. We seek and apply for public and private funding to support the educational, emotional, and social needs of our students. Program design and decisions to pursue grants are aligned with district priorities and data-driven identified needs. We look to coordinate funding sources to maximize the use of funds. And on a daily basis, the Grants Office provides technical assistance to all buildings that have programs funded through grants, as well as the non-publics that receive equitable shares of our title grants. The district receives both competitive and allocational grants. Allocational grants are those grants from New York State Education Department that all districts receive based on a particular formula for any given grant. We must follow all the grant requirements for program design, narrative and allowable budget expenditures and submit within the given due date and timeline in order to receive the funding. Competitive grants are just that. We compete with other applicants for available funding. Depending on how well your application scores in the context of other applications submitted determines whether or not we are awarded the funds. This slide depicts the new competitive and allocational grants received for this school year. So we've received the extended school day violence prevention grant that serves um, Hackett, Montessori, and North Albany Middle School. We received the local government records management grant. That's to help to um, organize all of our archived files for our graduates and all of our new registrants. We received the learning technology grant 
And we've also received the USDA freight farm grant, which will provide a freight farm, hydroponic farm, container farm at the high school. And as you're all very well aware of, the new allocational grants for this year are the COVID relief fundings, the um, SERISA and ARP, which are the acronyms for what you see up there. Also for this school year, we have recurring grants. Recurring competitive grants are those that are funded annually over multiple years. Recurring allocational grants are those that we receive an allocation for annually and must submit a new application in order to receive them. And this slide depicts the recurring grants we have for this school year. We're in our final year of the 21st Century Community Learning Schools grant. Uh, we have one more year of the Empire State After School Program grant. This is the final year for the My Brother's Keeper Challenge grant that we've had for a few years. The McKinney Bento Homeless grant also ends this year. And the My Brother's Keeper Fellows grant um, and Smart Scholars end um, this year as well. Allocational grants that we receive each year are the consolidated application that consists of all of our title grants. IDEA 611 and 619 support our special ed programs. And then um, our school improvement grants for those schools who are identified. Um, we have a basic grant. And then this year we have an enhanced grant that is for our TSI schools and a targeted support grant for our CSI schools. It provides them additional funding on top of their basic school improvement grants. Universal Pre-K and Perkins, um, which supports our um, CTE programs. So the next um, few slides are just going to be some details about our new allocational funding, the COVID relief funds, the SARISA and um, ARP funds, and I'll start with SARISA. This is one of the one-time COVID relief funds that the school district received this year. SARISA, or the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Grant, was the first round of this funding. Um, you'll see there it's uh, $14 million plus dollars. It expires September 30th, 2023, which means we those funds are all available through that time period. You'll see the allowable use of funds. I like the term when they say it's a wide range of activities to address diverse needs arising from or exacerbated by COVID, but then there's lots and lots of documentation with um, all of the um, sub areas um, that fall within that for the allowable use of funds. But um, I've included here just, you know, the second bullet, which kind of encapsulates most of those. We're really looking at focusing on responding to students, social, emotional, mental health and academic and academic needs. Um, the, um, the district use of funds focused on the following areas, educational technology, mental health services and support, supplemental after school programs, addressing learning loss and staff necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of services. This provides some SARISA budget details. So the budget submitted um, for the SARISA grant um, was submitted with the intent of utilizing the full $14 million in the 21-22 school year. And so you'll see this chart where the blue line represents what was budgeted in the particular category. And the, on my screen is red-ish, um, the encumbered and expense to date. Encumbered meaning we've entered into a purchase order for those services, um, expensed means we've entered into it and we've had the service um, and have paid. And you can see here that um, predominant amount of those funds um, have gone for um, salaries and um, the associated benefits. The ARP grants. This is the American Rescue Plan funds. It was the next round of funding we received. We had a base allocation and three state reserve allocations. You can see here what the ARP base grant amount was and then each of the three state reserve grants. 
All these grants expire September 30th, 2024. I think most of you are familiar with the um, fact that the ARC was developed based on community and stakeholder input. The um, budget was developed and the plan was developed following the required process for the community and stakeholder input. It was done through a survey. You can see here the number of responses and who participated in those surveys. Um, and through that process, the district highlighted our ARC planning process and the opportunity for that public input um, and we will regularly and we are regularly monitoring that um, and we'll continue to use sur um, surveys to gain input um, as we go along with um, implementing the grant because we know that um, these are proposed plans in a lot of situations and things change and so there's always opportunities to revisit that getting um, increased input um, and make amendments This is just some more information about the ARC grants. Um, the priorities that were identified through that stakeholder process, you can see here, were the social, emotional, and mental health supports, educational technology, safety and security, the HVAC systems, and accelerated learning and academic support. The grant program and budget um, were developed over the course of the grant period, so it's essentially three years. So we have an internal three-year budget um, to follow for the total amount of those funds. And I'll be giving you some more information about that in the next couple of slides. So this is the ARP budget details for the entire grant period, 2021 through 2024. So you'll see down there um, at the bottom of the slide, uh, color coded, this year is the blue, and then you'll see the following two years um, in the reddish oranges color and green again you'll see that um, a predominant um, amount of funds are for professional salaries not at support salaries there are associated benefits and um, purchased services um, and that makes sense because those things um, provide the services to the students um, you see a higher amount devoted to purchase services in the 2021-22 school year because that is where the HVAC services are budgeted at a cost of about $6.2 million. The professional salaries go up over the next two years, as you can see, compared to 21-22, um, as we budgeted for um, a predominant amount of the salaries in the Sarissa grant for 21-22. They'll move um, to the ARP grant in the following year. This just depicts the um, activity to date with what was budgeted um, and what's been expensed and encumbered to date for the 21-22 school year. This slide gives you some information for all the grants we receive. So this is um, indicative of all of our competitive and allocational grants, including the Sarissa and ARP. And it's broken out by the budget categories, which um, gives information about opportunities for students. And again, you can see our trend is focused on salaries and benefits and purchase services, um, as these are the areas that provide direct services to students. This is just another slide um, that gives an overall picture of the total amount of grants um, from last year to this year. And you can see that there's a significant increase in the budgeted for 21-22, and that is due largely to the ARP and Sarissa grants. The unexpended funds in 2021 totals about $5.6 million. That's that difference between those two amounts there at the end year 2021. Of that, 2.3 million is available for us to budget and use in the 21-22 school year. This is for grants that um, allow carryover of unused funds for the next year. The balance of that is not available in carryover and these funds, the funds unexpended in these grants were um, unused largely due to COVID impacting program implementation. Carryover was allowed for grants for some grants that don't normally allow it due to COVID into this um, into last school year, 
So we had an increased amount of funds in the 2021 20, school year as well. Unfortunately, though, with some of the COVID um, challenges, um, program was still impacted and um, funds were not used to the extent that we thought that they would be. Priorities for the 21-22 uh, school year are to continue to coordinate funding sources to maximize the use of funds. Um, to continue to collaborate with all the divisions and schools to prioritize and seek funding for programs that cannot be accommodated by the general fund. And we conduct ongoing searches for grant opportunities aligned to needs and priorities and ensuring we have tight internal controls for fiscal oversight of all grants for auditing purposes. And the final slide for this evening gives some information about the funding forecast to date. Um, we just submitted the Refugee School Impact Grant, um, and that is pending. That will um, support the AIC and dual program. Um, we applied for the, the next round of the 21st Century Community Le Learning Schools Grant. As I mentioned earlier, um, that round ends this year. Um, that's the same for the McKinney-Vento Homeless Grant. Um, the first round that we received um, will be ending this year and we'll be um, applying for the next round. We're still, it's still pending release from state ed. And there'll be another UPK expansion grant coming out hopefully um, this summer. And that concludes my presentation and um, I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mrs. Leffler. We very, very, very much appreciate your work. We know how much of a difference it makes to our students to have these additional funds beyond what we can afford with our um, property tax and state ed budget. We really appreciate all the work you and your team do to make sure these funds keep coming and that they're reported on properly, which I know is a not inconsequential task. So thank you. Thank you. Board colleagues, um, does anyone have a question? And my apologies, folks, um, if you notice my camera is off, I'm having some sort of Teams hates me moment, but perhaps teams will get over me and, and be willing to let me back in, in a minute. Meanwhile, questions? Board Member Smith. Well, thank you, Ms. Leffler. And this probably is a question that I should have asked during the COVID piece, but it might relate to the grants. Um, uh, Superintendent, do you, do you think there's a possibility that we will uh, be able to uh, have field trips be re, uh, you know, instituted uh, in the spring as we are able to get more outdoors and uh, does the some of these grant funds that we're carrying over allow for us to or support those kinds of things so yeah, our field I, trips, yeah. oh, i'm sorry that's okay our field trips are uh, based on where we can go with the covid protocols uh, where we can go we will go we have allowed field trips um, that we really do examine what are the covid protocols that are in place um, we also look at requirements that are needed. Um, so I'll use one example uh, with our JROTC program. Uh, we've granted several field trips because it is a requirement for them to maintain their ability to have the JROTC at the high school. And so when there are things like that that are prerequisites or conditional, absolutely we try to make those arrangements and make sure that the COVID protocols are in place. We've done local field trips um, and we've done those on a case by case situation. Again, looking at the COVID protocols uh, for our students. Uh, Ms. Leffler, with regard to whether they are permitted in grants, I will turn that over to you. <laughs> yes, certainly. Um, field trips are, are, are permitted in the grants um, and we have written them into the grants. Um, I know the My Brothers Keeper Challenge grant has them written in. Um, 21st century has them written in um, and you know if they're not written in at the outset and um, we want to add them in after because we've identified some that would support the program as it's approved um, we're able to amend and do that as well that's great and that's really where i was trying to get to like i'm trying to be a little more optimistic about down the road and so i do appreciate that <laughs> and i i was aware that we were doing some field trips but sort of thinking wow, what could that look like once we sort of get into a different realm so thank you both other questions for Ms. Lefa? Ms. Bessel. 
thank you for your presentation. And this may be strictly um, theoretical, but I was curious about like our investment. And I know, again, it's COVID, so it's not normal. But our investment in travel and conferences, I just assume, results in professional development rate for our teachers and staff. And thus, we get to embed that in the district versus sometimes I see we may use a community partner, which I love, and they might have like a proprietary or, you know, individual um, what's the word, like a service that they're giving us, right? But we pay them to do it. And do you think there's a contrast between, and maybe it just so, so happens that it's just, we want to utilize the provider or they may provide something that is truly unique. Or do you think there's a contrast in sending our folks to more conferences to like basically develop more of those skills and thus we have it distributed through the district? Or is that like just really abstract and not true? <laughs> so I'm just curious about that. Um, well, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Are you asking whether or not um, we prefer to send folks to away to a, a traveling conference somewhere and then bring that if information? It's a strategy. Back? Yeah, like if it's a strategy on our behalf. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I think there are some some professional development topics that lend themselves better for, for each of the scenarios you've um, talked about. And, and yes, I, I think depending on that, um, the offices that coordinate the professional development look to that. And it, I think it's um, topic specific, right? So, um, you know, having the provider come in that um, has proprietary and specializes in a particular area that comes into the district for certain things um, certainly is a, is a better way to go and we do that. Um, and there are some conferences that it just is better to send them to the institute. I'm going to um, give an example: the um, the uh, standards institute that folks attend. Um, that um, definitely is one that I would say that folks would say that um, the teams that go to that uh, really benefit from that more greatly, given the way it's run and the topic. Thank you for that insight. Thank you, Board Member Almeida. Thank you, Ms. Loeffler. Um, I had a technical or logistical question regarding um, basically slides seven and ten. There are uh, graphs pertaining to Sarissa budget details and then the ARP. I just quick question about the employee benefits, and I'm just wondering. So when you're looking at seven um, or slide seven, it shows that um, what we are encumbered is very low. I mean, like yep. comparatively. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, same with and, and just the same with the uh, ARP funds. Yep. I can answer that for you. Yeah. Um, so uh, the system by which we um, expense or 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 show the expense for employee benefits is done on a quarterly basis. And when I pulled this information for this report. That's quarter one and quarter two, and in some situations, um, for some of the for some of the salaries that have been moved over, that um, the, the benefits haven't been taken yet. So, um, you know that that will increase at the end and, of the year. Be depicted that way. So, and I can certainly, um, if you're interested in that, at a at a at a later time as we move uh, move closer to taking quarters three and quarters four can include that in an update so that you can see those expenditures. I was I was thinking that was the case. I just wanted to confirm thanks. I have a quick question, a very detailed one, which um, has to do with the, the on the slide. And I'm sorry, my self-inflicted um, connectivity issue problem here is preventing me from coming to the slide. So I can't tell you what slide number, but there was the one slide that you called out. There was a very, very high number that was the HVAC services. Mm -hmm. I just was surprised that they were called HVAC services. Um, I'm wondering. Yeah, if interestingly enough, I, I, I did too. So um, we had put, what's actually in there. We had put um, when we originally applied for the grant, those were placed into equipment supplies um, and state had actually um, kicked it back to us um, because it's kind of a complex process in terms of there's some of it that is um, contractual in um, in the installation piece. And so um, when I reached out to um, Ms. Roaring to get the more details about 
what the breakout is were for how much percentage to uh, an amount for supplies and equipment and amount for the contractual piece for the services for installation and provided that breakdown to state ed, they um, preferred it to be in contractual as a purchase service. I and we submitted it that way. I understand. So that's really an uh, an artifact of the way the submission went. But actually, what's in that services line is actually in some portion of it is is physical objects as opposed Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. That makes way more sense because that's a lot of services. I need to make a career choice if that's how it's going to roll. Uh, Ms. Smith. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I wanted to ask um, if you are seeing, especially uh, sort of the traditional grants, I know they're reacting to COVID, but more importantly, are you seeing grants that are speaking more to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Are they using that kind of language and uh, or metrics uh, as well in reporting? And this this may not be something that's actually happening. I'm just yeah. sort of trying to figure out like what trends we're going to see, and and whether you know some of the things that we are doing in that area of equity and so forth are are supported through some of our you know traditional grants. Um, and you may have other new. You might be seeing new opportunities out there. I, I had no idea, but just wanted to inquire on that front. We have definitely seen in the more recent um, applications that have come out that they're using that language and they're using that language um, in this way. They're using it um, for you to um, identify and demonstrate that in the needs section and also in how um, you're going to address that need then in your programmatic areas. So they've um, started to use that language and, and, and require that just like they have traditionally used it for economically disadvantaged um, and, um, you know, different subgroups, if you will. So it sounds, so would you, again, I'm not, don't want to get too far off in the weeds here. So the new language, but is it really different than how you would have, you know, put information in there? In other words, I'm trying to see how deep this not, language not goes. Deep, not deep yet. Okay. <laughs> just, All right. It's really just starting to emerge, I think. Okay, thank you very much for patience on that one. Oh, no worries. So my my last question, I don't know if anybody has any others. Um, I It is not infrequent for me to get a, uh, a comment from a community member. Oh, there's this great grant you should apply for. And I say, well, we have a whole team of people who do that. Um, and I am right, a whole team too. Well, it's a team that's not me. Um, so what I normally do is is suggest that they speak to the principal for if it's a smaller grant or to the grants office if it's something that's more substantial. And I just wanted to validate with you that that because I think that is something we talked about some many years ago and now it's blurry on me. So I just want to make sure that's your your preferred approach. Yeah, that's correct. And um, and the building principals and other folks in the district know that if um, they uh, um, have an opportunity for a smaller grant, we're there to help support them to provide information, do a read or an edit or help with any writing. Um, but also we just request and they know to let the grants office know because then we can help navigate receipt of those funds because um, that's an important piece. Um, because if, if, if we don't help them navigate that, the funds can come in in a way that um, can be tricky for us to accept and use. Terrific. Well, I appreciate that reminder because I think that you know, people are always looking to find ways that they can help help the district. And I, I know that you watch all the things and you probably know about every single grant that we could potentially be interested in. But I'm going to keep sending people to you who think they no, know. That's fine. They, yeah. that's fine. I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't know about every single one of them, but many of them <laughs> that are important to us. So, Anyone else for Ms. Leffler? All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate you and your team. Very small team. Um, so yeah. thanks so much for everything you do. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Have, Have a good, good night. Last but not least tonight, we are going to continue our discussion of the 22-23 budget. So Deputy Superintendent Roaring presumably is out there somewhere. Yes, I am. Good evening, Board of Education. I am pleased to provide you with our update on our budget development process this evening. 
As always, when we work through our budget development process, we recenter all of our work through our vision, mission, and goals to make sure that that is at the fore of our, every decision and recommendation we make. Tonight, we're going to review the New York State Comptroller's Office fiscal stress for fiscal year 2021. Uh, update on our budget process as well as our modified rollover expense. Take a look at the governor's proposed budget and its implications for our revenue for 22-23. Starting with the state comptroller's fiscal stress for fiscal year 2021. Indicators that are included in our low liquidity, operating deficits, low fund balance and environmental factors. Albany City School District had an environmental score for 2021 of 31.7 points. I think it's important to note that that's actually down five points from the previous year. For our fiscal score in 2018-19, we had a designation of susceptible to fiscal stress, but for fiscal years 2019-20 and 2021, we had no designation. Below you'll see a four year trajectory of our fiscal score. It peaked in 2018-19, which was correlated to the use of $15 million in capital reserve for the North Al Albany Middle School and five year plan capital project, as well as not funding any reserves that year and having an unrestricted fund balance of less than 2%. I'm pleased to note that we have been funding our reserves over the last two years and we have an unrestricted fund balance closer to 4%. So we are down now to a score of 6.7. Looking at our budget calendar, we'll continue to provide updates over the next eight weeks or so while we develop the budget. On March 24th, there will be a virtual community budget presentation where we'll have the opportunity to receive input from the community in a very direct way before presenting the proposed budget on April 7th. Then on April 14th, we are anticipating board adoption. After that, there will be a series of virtual community budget presentations. Our public hearing will be on May 5th and our vote will be May 17th. This year, we have looked at a couple of key terms as part of our budget development process. Our rollover budget is all current staffing and programs from the general fund carried forward for the next fiscal year, along with our known contractual obligations. This year, we have a modified rollover budget, which includes the rollover budget, plus items that have been identified to be transferred from our one-time federal dollars into the general fund for 22-23. The modified rollover budget assumptions are that we are continuing with our existing programs and services, all of our contractual obligations, district operations, and staffing and benefits under our collective bargaining agreements. The modified rollover budget includes all of the above plus absorption of identified programs and staffing funded with the one-time federal dollars. The modified rollover budget does not include funding and staffing requests submitted for 22-23, addressing any mandates that would require more resources or other items considered to be essential for programming health and safety. The modified rollover budget includes renewing our HVAC preventive maintenance contract as well as funding a pool maintenance contract for the five pools across the district. At this time it still includes our summer school that it being returned to the general fund but we are having ongoing conversations about potential other sources of funding for that. Uh, it restores our extended day and night school program at a Brooklyn to the 2019-20 pre-pandemic level, as well as additional behavior specialists and nursing positions that have been added during 21-22. Additional modified rollover budget inclusions to maintain current programs and operations are an increase for our software licenses to build in those previously funded by grants, an increase in our technology hardware to support Chromebook replacement schedule now that we are a one-to-one -one district, as well as increasing funding for hall monitors and maintenance over time to support programming and facilities use. Lastly, the modified rollover budget includes funding for identified programs and staff that were previously expensed in Sarissa and ARP dollars to be woven into the general fund, including the Albany International Center and expansion of the dual language program, Tony Clement Center for Education, as well as various faculty support and administrative positions. Changes to our modified rollover budget since we last met as of February 10th, we have had a reduction in our contribution rate um, for the employer in the ERS system. We have also made some adjustments in the positions, including those that are absorbed from one time federal dollars. And we've had an increase in bonuses expenses based on updated information that we have received. 
Our modified rollover expense budget as of February 10th stands at 287.58 million. This is a difference year over year of 17.3 million or 6.4%. Again, the number above does not include any new funding or staffing requests submitted for 22-23, additional items needed to address mandates or additional items considered essential for programming health and safety. We have been notified of 40 retirements, one in our administrators union, 29 in our teachers union and 11 in our support union. Looking at Governor Hochul's proposed budget that she has released, uh, the state budget includes for K-12 education, $2.1 billion increase in funding. Of that 1.6 billion is dedicated to fund foundation aid increases and 466 million for other programs. We are in year two of a three-year path to fully fund foundation aid. We are expecting to receive half of our remaining balance in 22-23 and then the final piece in 23-24. The budget also includes or continues the community school set aside as part of the foundation aid total, which is approximately 4.49 million. It fully funds expense-based aid such as transportation, public and private access cost, building aid and BOCES special services aid, all of which Albany receives. Continuation of categorical aids at the same per student allocation for textbooks, software, hardware, and library materials. A charter school tuition rate increase of 4.7%, which is very close to what we anticipated it to be in our modified rollover budget. And then there's a new program that's proposed, uh, funding at $100 million over two years. It would be matching funds for social, emotional, and academic supports for students. The district will be required to match that with ARP dollars. We're waiting to see if this comes into the final budget that's approved by the legislature and then what the guidance is around that. Our revenue sources are in four buckets. The first is our local revenue, which is largely comprised of property taxes, as well as uh, consumer utility taxes and payments in lieu of taxes or pilots. Our state aid is uh, comprised of STAR reimbursement, foundation aid, various categorical aids, post special services aid and instructional materials aids, Federal is comprised of Medicaid assistance and E-rate. And in our other category, we have our interest earnings, district billings, appropriated fund balance and reserves, and rebates and refunds largely associated with our health insurance. At this time, our 22-23 revenue budget is projected to be $285.9 million. That is a year-over-year -year difference of $15.64 million. Revenue will continue to be reviewed and updated as additional information becomes available. This number of $285.9 million does include continued use of restricted reserves and appropriated fund balance of $3 million, and it assumes a flat property tax levy. When we look at our revenue estimate by source, we'll note that there's a small decrease in our local revenue, largely attributable to decreased interest and penalties on our taxes. We have a significant increase in state aid, which is primarily attributed to foundation aid increases. We have an increase of about $430,000 anticipated in federal aid associated with Medicaid reimbursement, and then a decrease in our other largely attributed to reduced uh, tuition and rental billings. Again, for a total of $285.9 million or an increase year over year of $15.64 million. When we take our initial revenue budget and compare that with our modified rollover expenses of February 10th, we have a gap of 1.678 million. We also wanna to touch on our debt service this evening. Uh, debt services expense associated with capital construction projects on our schools and buildings. It includes both costs for long-term borrowing, which is our bonds or our short-term borrowing bands, which is for our construction in progress. Projects that will be in construction during 22-23 include Albany High Phase 4, which we anticipate finishing by the end of that year. We will commence construction of Phase 4, uh, North Albany Middle School, and completion of the district's five-year plan. Debt service projections over the next several years. Um, this shows what we anticipate the debt service to be each year. And then the next column is our estimated building aid for that year. And the final column is the net local share, or the difference between the two. You'll see that we start to peak in 25, 26, and we have several years at a little over $8 million in difference. So as we're looking at a new five-year plan for the district, we're working very closely at how that debt service will cycle and when is the best time to bring it on without having a significant increase in our debt service expense, which would impact our program.
As we continue our budget development process, some of the variables that are in play are state aid, which is typically finalized at the end of March with the legislative budget, health insurance increases, which are finalized later in March with additional data, our tax cap, which will be submitted by March 1st, the tax levy, which is adopted by the board when you adopt the budget in April. Uh, we're still continuing to analyze the impact of the retirements we've learned of and any impact from COVID-19 as we plan for 22-23. Our next steps include finalizing the district's priority, priorities, incorporating new information as it becomes available, continue reviewing our projections, our estimates, and our assumptions, as well as responding to questions, incorporating feedback that we receive from the board, community, our community budget committee, and staff, as well as continuing our lobbying efforts. And I will take any questions you may have. Board colleagues, um, I appreciate Deputy Superintendent Roaring um, revisiting the material from the last meeting. I had asked her to do that because I know uh, while well, it was a review for us, community members join into this process at any time. And so um, I asked her to include those slides that show why the rollover budget is um, such a substantial increase as we absorb those positions back from the um, Sarissa and APPR funds. So we can certainly ask any questions about that, although that was something we talked about at some length last time. So does anybody have any questions about the rollover budget part of the presentation before we move on to the um, new material, which had to do with the governor's um, proposed budget? I actually like a comment about slide four. Go um, for it, slide four. So where it talks about environmental score and fiscal score, I just want to point out to people that the environmental score really is nothing in our control because it's a factor that involves like the poverty, uh, it involves the number of uh, non-English speakers, the uh, turnover ratio and things like that, which we have no control over really. Uh, and so even though it may be bigger, that's the nature of any urban school district. The fiscal score is a measure of the fiscal stress and we're doing pretty good. Absolutely, I like to say that it's, yes, we know. Right, that, that's exactly what we say every time we go to lobby our folks um, that we lobby every single year and frequently throughout the years. We are under extreme environmental stress. That is the reality of our situation. We have a lot of children who have a lot of needs. That's what that score means. So it is a really good score. I think it's actually useful. I just wish it wasn't in the same report as the fiscal score because it, it implies that there's they're somehow similar and they're such totally different things. Um, uh, anything else on the fiscal fiscal stress the piece before we move off of that? All right, Ms. Wilson, did you have a question? Oh, no, no, that's fine. Anything else on rollover? If not, then anything on the governor's budget proposal? I am still slow to open documents, so I can't give you slide numbers. I apologize. 14. Dr. Tutor, Board Secretary Tutorial is feeding me my lines. 14. Anything about the governor's proposed budget, which is now up on the slide here. Um, I think everyone, when you see your legislators, thank them, right? The fact is that fulfilling our foundation, the promise of foundation aid is a huge major improvement, right? It's a weird year because we have absorbed a lot of stuff from Sarissa and ARP, so we have expanded our services as we desperately need to to address the opportunities our students were denied because of the various challenges faced by COVID. And that's why our budget has like gone up so substantially. But if, if we did not have that increase in foundation aid this year, we would have a very, very serious problem. So, um, so really, when you see your folks, um, thank them, write them letters. Um, and you know our legislative priorities still exist. We still think so, think there are things that they should be doing um, to make things even more equitable in the state. But it, but it, the, this proposal um, is is a much better than we have typically seen at this stage in the budget process. Also, I know everyone knows generally when the state budget is adopted, it never gets worse than what the government. <laughs> typically, never say never, but typically it it, it gets better. Um, or at least not, doesn't go down. So we'll see. Um, anything else people wanted to ask here? How about, I think next is debt service is the next category. Revenue sources, which is really the overall revenue picture. Anybody on revenue? Otherwise, I think we'll all move to debt. Did I do them out of order? Debt service, here we go. 
Um, I had one quick question about debt service that requires the slide with millions of numbers on it. If you could move to that slide 21, thank you. Um, I am just noticing, I always, when I look at this slide, I notice the, the um, it's not the gross amount, it's the change, right? So I see that next year our um, debt service is going to go down by one point three million dollars and we're suddenly going to have 1.3 million dollars that we can spend on something else um, and then two years later it goes up by almost the same amount to 8.4 so in our fiscal planning if i were doing this for my own household i would put that 1.3 in a reserve fund knowing that i was going to need it to fill out my budget two years later is that a logical way to look at these numbers or am i you know oversimplifying no, I think as you're looking at the net local share on the far right hand side, that is um, actually a very accurate way of looking at it. It's really important to watch the ebb and flow of that so that as we recognize some savings in one year, we could either look to save it um, in a reserve fund and pull it in later or use it for some one time expenditures that we may need to do that year. So but not necessarily commit to recurring expenditures with those dollars, as you know, they would be needed again in two years. Right. So, uh, you know, a year from now, when we're having this conversation, we will be having it with someone who is not you. Um, and so, you know, we as a team, I think, need to kind of start putting that piece in our head that this 1.3, and I'm sure whoever um, is filling Deputy Superintendent's roaring chair will also be able to guide us through this. But that $1.3 million, if we add $1.3 million worth of teachers, we're going to be all good for like two years. And then that third year, we're going to be short $1.3 million worth of staffing expenses and have to either raise taxes or somehow, I don't know, rob a bank or get a donation or something, get money somewhere. So just, I just want to, this, these numbers, because we've been so deeply invested in construction, um, are, are big and make big difference in our, in our lives. So, um, okay. That was my question on debt. Does anybody else have questions on debt? Everybody gets this, right? Like the way this, this crazy thing works that the state pays us back a year after and that's why these numbers don't, they don't stay the same. So it's just like this reimbursement problem. Okay. Actually, um, Ms. Roaring, can you, can you remind us about, do you remember there's something about the small city's debt ceiling that we face? So as a small city, we have a statutory debt limit that has a correlation to the city. Um, and that does restrict what we can do independently um, without a supermajority vote, which the district did receive for its North Albany Middle School project and five year plan because we have exceeded our statutory debt limit at this time. Yeah, we, we had that as a legislative part. I think um, NISBO, some, uh, some, some of the business officials organization had that as a priority for a while to try and get that fixed because um, there's no reason that we're different than everybody else. Just another thing we have to argue, fight with. Okay. Um, can you progress the slide, Ms. Bowie, so I can figure out what's going on because I'm still not able to see. Ah, uh, yes, budget variables. Um, so this is what, this is sort of looking forward, what else is going to happen um, and how it's going to happen. One question I had here is, I know you were very clear at the beginning to say that this does not include any of the many things that have been put at, um, in program reviews as additional supports that would be beneficial for our students. Um, but then I think on the next slide, it says, you know, continue to prioritize district priorities, which I finalize district priorities, which I think means figure out what, if anything else, we can do in comparison to how much money we have, right? Um, because we don't have any new programming in here at all, um, any of the new supports that we, we know would be beneficial. Um, and so do you have a sense of timing of when that, when we'd be in a position to see, are you going to wait to really try and finalize district ask until we know what the state adopted budget really looks like? Is, is that what we're expecting or how is that going to play forward? So I over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be working very closely to um, bring to you by March 3rd a balanced budget and then our priority ads should additional revenue materialize either through um, an increase in the tax levy or additional state aid or wherever it may come from. That's our target. I understand March. So March 3rd, we should see a balanced budget and then after that we can address what happens next, which of course will require April 1st to come and go before we're able to really understand what our real final situation is. Okay. Um, other people have questions? Then I have one more because I'm the budget person and I always have questions. And I realize I should have asked Ms. Leffler and I apologize. 
I am still having a hard time visualizing what is left in the ARP and Sarissa money. This year, we're bringing a whole ton of stuff back, right? We're saying we, we use Sarissa and ARP money to fund these things, but we want to continue them. So we're bringing them into the operational budget. And so our budget went up like, I don't know, $6 million of staffing. I, I would like to know what else is in ARP and Sarissa that, that we would like to bring back so that I can visualize what the next two or three budgets are going to look like as we try and bring this back. And so I think I probably should have asked Ms. Luffler that question, and I didn't think of it when she was here. Um, and I wonder what it would take for us to get some sort of at least overall understanding of that. It doesn't have to be to the penny. I'm just trying to understand, like, what's out there that's going to come back to us next year. So that's part of the process of what we're doing um, within the budget process when we explain um, how we go about looking at what are those priorities that we're going to roll into the general fund and being able to show those positions. That's part of that process, as Ms. Roran said, about having a balanced budget with what the executive proposal is so that we can clearly see here's where we are right now and then these are the positions that we are budgeting from or rolling over from ARP into that general fund because, again, we're looking at stability and sustainability of what we know is working for our students. And so we're in the process of reconciling that right now. Um, a portion of that work that Ms. Leffler has to do that she is still working on is making sure that um, because we're looking at those positions because you have to remember some of those positions may have been vacant. So there are dollars that are still out there that weren't used. There are some that were hired later than the actual start date. So there's the calculation of that that has to be incorporated in there. And so as they go through, um, so I'm visualizing. So the, the report that we have online, our ARP report and that spreadsheet portion that shows how much was for salaries and for different categories. Well, what we have that we have had to connect the dots with is there's a lump sum that you see for what we spent for salaries. Then we have the list of what were those actual positions. And you have to remember that when we did that from the beginning, we used an average dollar amount. Well, we now have actual salaries in those lines. So there's part of that calculation that has to go as well. And so we are in the process of reconciling all of that information and then prioritizing here are those things that we said we were going to roll into the general fund. But now there may be some discrepancies with regard to, oh, this position ended up costing X, this one cost Y, and we have 10 of them at Y, so now we may have to hold on to X for the next couple of years or for the next year. Um, initially, when we looked at what the priorities, those five priorities, when we looked at those priorities and what we were allocating each year, at the very beginning, we did three years equally. But then as you start to build in, you realize that no, we might need to do more in year one now we have true one-time funds. Here's the list of those. So now those one-time funds roll off. Here are the positions that we're going to absorb in the general fund. Are we able to absorb all of what we thought we were right now? If the answer is yes, green check, yay. But if some of those positions, let's say we had a more experienced person in one position, least experienced, another uh, lesser experienced person in another one, we have to now balance that out and see what we can truly absorb and then what might we have to continue in ARP for the next year. And so those are the things that are happening that we are looking uh, roughly the end of February, beginning of March, so that we could bring that forward. Um, because again, some of that we might have to make some predictions about um, based on where we are within the budget. But we do have a trajectory of, especially with the ARP, and I'm visualizing our spreadsheet that we're using. Um, here's what we said we were going to do year one. Here's what we said that we knew we would have to carry over for year two and year three. Um, however, some of that we may be able to absorb earlier. 
And so that's why we're looking at balancing right now with the executive budget, because then if we receive additional funds, we have our priorities listed as to what we may be able to still carry over. I understood a, very, a relatively large portion of that. Um, and I just, for me, the, the issue is making sure I have a visual on, I don't need to know down to the position level, but at the at the large chunk, like the big rock level, because it, I, in my mind, it affects my appetite for a property tax increase this year, knowing what we can and cannot cover in years two and three and four, because I know that the implications of a zero versus a 0.5 versus a one versus a 1.5 have compounding effects in future years. Um, and I know that when I was very early on this board, there was a great interest in having 0% property tax increases and there were 0% property tax increases in them. And we paid consequences for the 0% property taxes um, in later years because there was not the, the compounding in, increase of those. So having a sense of, okay, well, we do expect the foundation aid chunk to go up again a lot next year, right? As they deliver the other half of foundation aid, right? We expect, don't know, expect, that's what they've said they've gonna, they were gonna do, they fulfilled their promise this year. I have to believe they're gonna fulfill their promise next year. How does that counterbalance what remains of the services that we're still covering? And how does that, what does that mean to me as a person who's trying to represent this whole city that's very respectful of the fact that property taxes are very high here and we have, in my seven years on the board, really held the line on property taxes in a very real way so that we balance, we no longer take half of, more than half of our revenue from property taxes as we used to when I first got here. We're now under that. That's really important. Um, but I just, I, that's what I need to know. It's not that I need to know the level of detail, but I do, I need to have some semblance of understanding of where we're going on the, on the out years. And, and I, that's the process to try and get there. And so sounds good. we are looking at March uh, having that available um, because we do know and recognize that impact. And just like we did last year, we're going to show what that impact is for, we're going to continue with that. We're going to show the impact Perfect. of zero tax and what that looks like moving forward because that's part of our process. That's good. Ms. Wilson. So this um, dialogue just sparked a thought in me that I increasingly see um, rhetoric of folks like we're transitioning out of um, the pandemic. And I wonder if there's a need for us to, or us and partners to establish a narrative that indeed we may be, or not, um, closing in on the, the end of the pandemic, but um, there will be a need for like a COVID reconstruction plan because I mean, we had some devastating losses and I don't think we can flip the switch and think that um, we can be back to what was normal. I don't think that's coming back, but even if we could, there's just not a, uh, there's not an infrastructure or, you know, the, you know, so I just have that thought process and it, it, maybe that's a legislative advocacy piece, but I just want there as much as people have their COVID um, pandemic fatigue and want to um, return to normal. I think we have to have the foresight to know that we need supports in that sense and money will be the bridge that will get us um, closer to something normal. Absolutely, thank you so very much for that. Anyone else on things budget? Otherwise, I think we're on to our last couple of things. Anyone with a committee report? Thank you, Ms. Roy. Thank you very much. Oh, I apologize. I should have thanked. I'm ready to go home. Sorry. Um, all right, no committee, seeing no committee reports tonight. Oh, you do have a committee report. Yeah, I'm just go gonna, ahead. Not much. I was just going to, I was letting those other folks go first. But um, first, I uh, wanted to um, uh, remind uh, committee members here and uh, public that we do have a facilities committee meeting on Tuesday, February 15th at 545 and virtual. So look out for that notification. Um, and then the only other thing I have is really under other business. Uh, if you would allow me to go there. Um, so uh, earlier today, I had a conversation with uh, Deputy Superintendent Noring, and uh, she has some information that she'd like to bring forward. Uh, she and Mr. Peckham from CS Arch, and it pertains to the gender neutral locker rooms. And uh, so I wanted to just turn it over to them and thank them for, uh, and Mr. Peckham in particular, for getting back to us. Um, with some additional information uh, that, that we'll need to proceed. So thank you. Ms. Warren. Thank you, Ms. Smith. 
Um, Mr. Peckham has joined us this evening. Uh, we heard very clearly from the board that you wanted us to take a second look at what we were doing in terms of accommodating a gender neutral locker room space with the request of modifications to the dance studio and fitness center. Um, we have grappled with that as a project team and um, have, are ready to share out an update. Um, it is time sensitive, so we asked if we could do it now uh, prior to our next quarterly update at the end of March. So, Mr. Peckham, if you would be willing to uh, share. Um, I don't think I have the ability to share right now. <laughs> That must not be designated as an organizer or a presenter. There we go. Now I am. Okay. So, um, as we talked the last uh, time we presented to the board, um, the area of the general neutral locker room that had been planned in the bid documents was. Um, taken over or proposed to be taken over for a dance studio and then relocating the cardio room. So as you can see on, on this plan, we have the area of the, the dance studio that's shown here, which is essentially the current um, fitness center for the athletic and PE department. And then we're building the weights and fitness center here and the cardio room, which was what was gonna be, that was the area that was gonna be the dance studio. Um, and this is the area that's currently the existing boiler room, essentially. So by relocating the dance studio and giving them more space by taking out the general neutral locker rooms, we created another location in this location, which was currently a couple um, small locker rooms that had been thought of as being used for officials. But in talking with Ashley Chapel, the officials only use that sometimes during basketball season. So to commit dedicated space to that um, with a need for a general neutral locker room um, does not necessarily uh, provide the best use for the district. So as requested by the board, we looked at doing something more than just designating those existing rooms as potential general neutral locker rooms and restricting some of the use because we talked about them not being handicap accessible and a couple other complications. So I will just show this proposed plan in a larger format here. Um, and you can see what we've been able to accommodate here is all of the functions, maybe not all the quantity that we had in the planned general neutral locker room, um, we've been able to create an entrance that's screened when you're when you're walking by in the corridors so if the doors open this wall will screen it so that you can't really see into the into the locker room which is always a goal in any locker rooms we do creates a handicapped accessible toilet room in this in the space um, we may modify this a little bit and not make it as enclosed room but make it more of a of a toilet stall potentially, um, just because of the issue with a, a toilet room and the lockability of the door that's uh, always a concern. And then we have three shower and changing stalls, one ADA handicapped accessible one, and then two other shower and changing stall, some lockers. We're only showing the bank of three lockers right now, but we have this whole wall. We can extend the, the number of lockers in this room and then a bench for for changing if they're not changing in the in the shower and changing areas. Um, question was asked as far as what the how this compares to what we had planned before. Um, before we had a total of five showers slash changing stalls for for um, with one of them being handicap accessible and this uh, modified plan provides three with one of them being handicap accessible provides the same lockers, uh, changing bench and toilet room that we would have in the previous plan. So that kind of goes through the general neutral locker room where we were at. Uh, a couple of other questions that have been asked, I'll go ahead and answer. There was a question raised about the team room for both the uh, boys locker room and the girls locker room and if those could be accessible from the corridor for students, uh, general neutral students, so they didn't have to go through the whole 
locker room if they were part of the team and needed to get in there. Um, obviously, they could be. Uh, you could add another door in this location to get into the boys' team room, but um, obviously it would take away lockers, and if you wanted to properly screen the door, it takes away space in the locker room. I don't know that it's too much of an issue if students could just come in these doors and then into the team locker room for the boys' team locker room because it's not like you're going through the entire locker room. You would come in these doors. These are the other main doors that are used for the locker room. So it's not like the student would have to come in here and go all the way through the locker room. They could come in this other door opposite where the general neutral locker room is going to be and just go in that door to the team room. On the girls team room side, um, you could do the same thing and have another door to the corridor, but again, it would take up space and lockers out of the team room. And again, there's a door directly from the corridor that's very close to the door to the team room. So there'd be a very easy path there again without having to come all the way through the rest of the locker room if that if that's an acceptable solution or or uh, um, mitigates the concern of that question. While we're on the team rooms, the question was asked um, about the size of the team rooms. And yes, the boys team room was an existing space really set up for football originally. And it's, it really was dedicated for football for a while, but now it's a more general team room. So in that case, the lockers in that team room are actually larger because they have to accommodate the football gear than the typical um, lockers are. So the, the boys team room um, is about 345 square feet, no, 365 square feet. And the girls' team room is about 240 square feet because we're creating this out of this space here in this area where we have the team room, this corridor, and um, three offices. This is the um, the athletic director's office area. Um, that's the space we had when we carved this out of what was the um, dance studio as it was originally constructed um, back in 74. That was the, this was the area that was the dance studio. And I think the other question that had been forwarded to me was how we're pre proposing to procure the changes for this flipping of the dance studio in the cardio room and the general neutral locker rooms if we were going to do that all as one big change order, which shouldn't be that big of a change order actually because we're just moving space around or whether we would do it as multiple change orders. Our recommendation is to do it all as one because it would get kind of confusing for the contractors to say if we did the changes for the general neutral locker room separately, they're going to have to give us a credit in one change proposal for taking them out of the dance studio, not knowing for sure whether the other change order is going to be accepted. And then they're going to they're take some of the same materials and put them back in in the general neutral locker room area. So we think it's better to just ask the contractors for um, one price to do all of the changes here. And I believe that answers the questions that had been forwarded to me. So I, at this point in time, I'll leave it open for questions. Questions? Who's got questions for Mr. Becker? Um, how about Ms. Wilson and then Ms. Critchie? Thank you for your presentation. And also, um, I, I'm glad that we have the visual. I think um, that probably was the missing piece all along. And I know it comes out of billable hours, but that just gives us some foresight that before we start conceptualizing things, um, we can have a visual aid. So thank you. Um, question. So I know there was a discussion before about out of town or guest referees. Do they still have that space? And I only ask because is that space accessible to more students in lieu of um, going from five to three. Just curious. Um, the space, because because this was, um, let me just share another drawing and I can explain it a little better probably. Um, so, and this isn't quite as graphically interesting because these are the construction documents from phase three, but this is what the um, general neutral locker room was going to plan to be a handicapped accessible 
shower changing area, four showers, and then the toilet room. So as I mentioned, we still have the toilet room, we still have the handicap accessible changing area shower, and then we've reduced it from four to two on the non-handicapped accessible changing. The other area that we had talked about, really the area that's becoming this new general neutral locker room was is here, they're labeled men's officials and women's officials, and that's the area that we're taking over. So Novia would not have that space. The district would just have to determine whether visiting officials, if they change even, um, whether they'd use the PE offices or some other facility to be able to change. Okay, I I'm understand now. So we made the swap totally out. So I understand. Thank you. I just had a very minor question, and it was just when you were describing about how to when people were asking for an entrance to the boys' team room that was outside the boys' locker room. Is there a reason you can't move the door to the boys' locker room just beyond the first door to the team room? Would that interfere with the plan to have, from what I understood for you saying, for the gender neutral locker room you wanted there, so that from the door there's no visible ability? Yeah, visibility. so you're saying just move these doors back. I thought mm -hmm. about that. The only the only thing is those doors are 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 already there, so it would just be the the cost of moving them, um, and no. whether whether the district felt that was worth the expense to do that. Oh yeah, never mind. I didn't know they were. Okay. If they're if they're doors that are just pieces of lines of graphite on paper, then we should move them. But if they're physical doors, we should leave them where they are. And, and I had the same question about the I said same question about the girls' locker room team room doors. But if those are already there, I guess yeah, keep them. Well, the girls' team room doors. This door has been cut in, I believe. So, and this door is. Um, yeah, this is an opening in the firewall that's been built. So that door really can't move or, or that door at this point in time. Thank you. Anyone else with questions? Board Member Amineau. Thanks, Rich. Um, just to stay on the uh, girls team room, is are those offices and is that team room like is already built out? Like are those partitions up or those walls up? Or is that just empty? And like I asked because, not to get too specific about this, but the office 3131, why isn't it like further up? Like I understand like there's a doorway here, but like there's like this little like space that condenses into like the, the yep. hall. I see what you're, what you're saying is that we could, we could oh, essentially up. move it up to there. Correct. Um, you know, I was over there. I don't think that they've really started building any of this, anything on the right hand side of this wall here, because this is all part of the. Open up more room for the um, girls team room. That's that's an interesting thought, and I will take a look at that, depending on if any of this has been started already. We could just take and slide those three offices up about uh, six or eight feet and add that space to the team room. Yes. I had a similar question at the top of the diagram. There's another weird jog where the hallway is skinny and fat, and I couldn't figure out whether there was a reason that it couldn't be. See to the left of 3154, the hallway is wide and then the hallway is narrow. Um, you see where it says storage 3154? Right there, I felt like that space could be enclosed for use for additional storage or something. I have no idea what it would be used for. It just seemed like a very, very, very large hallway that might might have utility someplace else. But you're the architect, and I'm happy to let you do your work. I just, but in the same way, Hassan looked at it and went, huh, what's that weird jog? I looked at that and went like, oh, what's that weird jog? Yeah, th this is essentially space that got left over because this is the, this is the wall, the phase one addition. This is the back wall of the original gymnasium, and that wall jogged like that, so that's why this corridor jogs. There's not a reason other than, a lot of times, there's not a reason other than money that this couldn't be enclosed and create more storage, um, but it'd be accessible from the corridor, because we've got toilets here and this storage here, unless you broke a door through there, but, you know, if, if it was felt that that 
added benefit to the district to enclose that. It's something that could be done. Have a conversation with the program staff. I'm certainly not going to say whether it's needed or not. I just know that I, in my experience, there's never enough storage ever. <laughs> Board member Krejci. I just wanted to say there's never enough storage, but there's also never enough room in the hallways because I know we've been experiencing complaints with people saying that, that some of the high school hallways are particularly crowded. So maybe we want to kind of give a, people a little wiggle room if we can to have spread out a little bit, especially if it's near. To, I don't know if people from would be coming through this way to see a sporting event, but, you know, if there might be crowds of people moving around. Yeah, this this floor, the gymnasium's up a floor, so there wouldn't be crowds of people down here. This is mainly just the athletes and PE down at this at this elevation. So, so and uh, thank you, Mr. Peckham. And I just wanted to, with even the suggestions that uh, Mr. Elman Yawi has uh, proposed, et cetera, if we could just make sure we see what the cost difference is. I mean, it, it seems to be minor to move walls, but um, I'm not sure. I just want to make sure we're not too tight there. Um, and equally, if you're talking about doing something um, up above in the storage area, we just need to know what that means over the addition of the bathrooms and so forth. Go ahead. And I just want to add that I would like to see the renderings and the ideas, but also there is a benefit to negative space because of that inherent room to grow at a later time if necessary. So that's just something to consider also. All right, well, I think that we have um, reached a point where people feel that the, the needs have been addressed, right? So we can go forward and, and develop whatever, do the change order, whatever happens next. And yes, and so uh, Ms. Roaring, and thank you, Mr. Peckham, very much. And uh, you're appreciate your hearing us and addressing those concerns. Um, Ms. Roaring, could you just speak again a little bit to what's next? Um, I know we have a facilities meeting next week, um, but you, the, what you're asking us to do tonight, or you wanted us to have this information tonight so that um, you can move forward with the next steps. Could you just articulate those for us? Yes. Um, so we wanted to share this out with the board this evening just to get the general sense as to whether or not the board felt that this met the um, request and the need for our students going forward so that we could proceed. Uh, Mr. Packham's team would be responsible for creating uh, changing conditions. Um, and providing some direction to the contractors of what we're looking to do so that they could prepare pricing and formal change order ultimately would arise. As he noted, there are there's already purchased work for a lot of these areas. So we are not anticipating a large increase as a result of the changes that we're making, um, but that is something that would have to be ferreted out. And we would continue to update the facilities committee and should it warrant a significant adjustment in costs, which we don't anticipate, it would certainly return to the board for approval. Great, thank you so much. Any other other business? Otherwise, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Ms. Smith, second by Dr. Chator. All in favor? That is unanimous times seven, and we will see you guys soon. The superintendent and I will be back shortly about to confirm whether or not we need next week. <laughs>